So welcome everyone. Uh, this is the WACV 2022 workshop on manipulation, adversarial and presentation attacks and biometrics. Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, uh, one more time virtual event. Uh, hopefully next time we'll see you um, at the conference. Um, a little bit about the workshop. So this is organized by um, my colleague Skiran Raja from NTNU, Julian Fieres from University of Autonoma de Madrid, and Raghavandra Ramachandra from NTNU, and myself, uh, Nasser Damer, I'm with the Fraunhofer IGD in Germany. <clears throat> so this workshop is the fourth edition and was previously uh, held as a special center and then as a workshop in, in Vitas 2018 and 2019. Um, and in WACV 2020 as a workshop, uh, we skipped last year due to uh, uncertain events, you know, with the corona and so, but we're back this year. Um, for this year, we received 13 submissions. Uh, they went into um, review and received on average 3.6 reviews per paper. Uh, some of them even five reviews and uh, one meta review that looked at the paper and the reviews themselves. From these 13 submissions, six papers are accepted and are presented orally today in, in this half a day workshop. Um, what's very exciting is that we have two very interesting keynotes. For me personally, I, I really want to hear these keynote uh, talks. Uh, one keynote is by Luisa Ferdoliva. Uh, she's an associate professor at the University of uh, Federico II of Naples, and she's leading the multimedia uh, and forensics labs. Uh, her talks is about defect detection, state of the art, and future direction. And um, the first keynote that we will hear in a few minutes is by Wael Abdel Majid, who's a research associate professor and research director at the, the different uh, units of USC uh, School of Engineering. Um, the title of the talk is Biometric Under Attack Where Do We Go From Here? and uh, with different aspects uh, related even to um, uh, ethics and biometrics. And uh, I think we all want to hear that. Uh, the program for today, today is that we start now with a keynote from Wael Abdel Majid and then move to the first oral sessions with three papers. Uh, first is about synthesizing face images from matching scores. Um, <clears throat> the second is about powerful uh, physical adversarial examples against practical face recognition systems. And the third is about morph detection enhanced by structure groups uh, sparsity. Uh, then we will have a 10 minute coffee break, uh, depending on where you are. <laughs> and then we move to the second section where we will have our second keynote talk from Luisa Fertoliva. Um, about defect detection, state of the art, and future directions, and move to the <clears throat> uh, next three oral uh, paper presentations uh, about one time biometric via uh, morphing applied to face templates. Uh, the second is about saliency guided texture contact lens aware iris recognition. And the last paper uh, that will be presented is a personalized benchmark for face anti spoofing. Uh, and with that, we will close our session. Uh, a small official note before we start, uh, the Zoom meeting for all workshop will be configured to record by default, so they are now uh, recording. And uh, the WACV organizers plan to archive the workshop recording later on to allow this. Uh, the authors are covered by uh, the IEEE copyright forms that they signed. And uh, we just need to inform you this uh, for official reasons. Um, and with that, we move to uh, our first keynote talk by Wael Abdel Majid. Wael Abdel Majid is a research associate professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and a research director at the Information Science Institute. And both are units of USC Viterbi uh, School of Engineering. Uh, his research interests include representation learning, debiasing and fair representation, multimedia forensic and visual misinformation identification, 
uh, Dr. Abdelmajid leads the viral multi uh, institution research effort, includes DABRA Medifor, GARD, LWLL, and IAPRA uh, Genus, Odin, and BRAAR. He has over 90 publications, computer vision, machine vision, biometric conferences, and journals, uh, including CVPR, NeurIPS, uh, ICCV, ECCV, uh, PAMI, TBIOM, ICB. And Dr. Abdelmajid is the recipient of the 2019 USC Information Science Institute Achievement Award. His research has also been featured in multiple um, media outlets like Forbes, Glamour, Fox News, Time for Kids, and PC Magazine. Um, we are so happy to have him here, and uh, we look forward to his exciting talk, and I'm sure it will revoke a lot of our uh, questions. Uh, so please, while you can go ahead, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Nasser. Can, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Can everybody see my screen? Um, not yet. We can okay. see you. How about now? Yes, now we, we can see. see. Perfect. OK. So thank you so much for, uh, for this very generous introduction, Nasser. I really appreciate it. And thanks for the invitation. Um, just a, fa a fun fact, four years ago when, when this workshop started, I was responsible for organizing BTAS in Los Angeles when Nasser and, uh, and Kiran and Raghu and, and Julian were organizing the first version of the workshop. And um, we assigned a small room for the workshop because it was the first day of the conference. And unexpectedly, so many people showed up to the, to the workshop and so many people are actually standing outside of the room wanting to get in and listen to what's, uh, what was a really interesting workshop for four years now. Um, we had to actually take a break. I think Kiran will remember that. We took a break and we moved the, con the workshop downstairs uh, to the auditorium. This basically says something about the quality of, of this workshop since it was uh, born. And again, I'm very grateful for the opportunity for everyone. <clears throat> so today we'll talk about biometrics under attack. Uh, where do we go from here? Um, just a quick um, acknowledgement for uh, my sponsors, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research uh, Projects Agency, and IARPA, the Intelligence Advanced Research uh, Projects Activity. Uh, these are the two main sponsors for what I'm going to present today. And uh, Last but not least, big thank you to my team. Without this team, I couldn't uh, be talking in this workshop today. This work is basically their work. I'm, I'm only here to present their work. So thank you for, uh, for my team. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. I will give a very quick overview on um, what, what, does, uh, what is the attack surface of biometric systems. And then I will talk very briefly about the limitations of legacy biometric systems, at least up to four, four or five years ago when, uh, when I started heavily focusing on biometrics. Um, I will talk about the state of the art in biometrics, at least from my perspective. I know this is subjective and different people will have different perspectives. I will talk about deep faking biometric systems. I will only brush on deep fakes because I know my colleague Louisa is going to, to uh, talk in detail about deep fakes later in the afternoon. I will talk about uh, some open research challenges uh, in biometrics from my perspective. And I will uh, end the talk with, with uh, some thoughts about ethical uh, AI and how that should be conducted. So what is that? What, the, what do I mean by the attack surface of biometric systems? Uh, this is basically a typical uh, or a prototypical um, pipeline of a, of, a, of a biometric system. You have a sensor, you have some feature extractor, and then you have a matcher that, that basically uh, compares an input signal to a bunch of uh, templates stored in a data set. And then you make a decision to grant entry to some secure entity uh, to whether or not to grant uh, uh, entry into some secure entity, whether it is just a, a smartphone or a high, 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 high security building. Right, And this basically pipeline, as simple as it is, actually has some uh, significant security holes. 
uh, you, you can count here, we have at least eight very clear security holes in terms of uh, people, adversaries who, who try to attack this simple pipeline, right? At least from my perspective, the black ones are not that, um, I, do, I wouldn't really worry about the black ones, simply because if an attacker or an adversary has access to over, override the feature extractor or synthesize a, a feature or something, technically speaking, the attacker owns the pipeline. So there is really not much you can do at that point. Right? What I really want to, uh, what I want to focus on, what worries me from a security perspective of a, of a biometric system are the two uh, uh, red attacks. The, what's called basically, what's known in the, in the biometrics community as presentation attacks. These are physical attacks against the biometric uh, system and digital attacks. And I will talk about that uh, in a few minutes, right? And digital attacks also can be uh, used as a, a, a presentation attacks as a presentation attack as I will show later on, right? So today I will talk about the work that we have been doing for the last five years in terms of presentation attacks and presentation attack detection, as well as some uh, very quick uh, or a brief overview about the work we have been doing in terms of deep fake detection from a biometric system uh, systems perspective. Right? Uh, along with all of these eight um, security holes or vulnerabilities of a biometric system, you can actually add at least up to four years or five years ago, two more complications. One, one of them is that legacy biometric sensors like just RGB cameras or iris cameras or even fingerprint sensors were not or originally designed to be um, used for presentation attack detection. They were used for authentication and authentication or recognition and presentation attack detection are two distinctly different problems. So these biometric sensors do not provide rich data streams that could be used for uh, a presentation attack detection. So this is one complication. And then the other thing is, if, if you think about it, even if you use uh, novel sensors or legacy sensors in a standard way where you collect some data, you train a biometric system to do presentation attack detection, it usually doesn't really work that well as you hope for, especially in face of uh, new or unknown attacks. You collect data given some certain attacks such as masks or makeup or, or 2D uh, printed attacks or screen attacks or replay attacks, but you end up with a, a 3D mask uh, attack or a printed uh, 3D mask attack. That actually, that, that you haven't seen before when you trained your system. So these are two additional complications, two vulnerabilities to the eight vulnerabilities of uh, a standard notional biometric system. Okay, so what, what have we done in the last five years uh, at, in my lab and in general in the biometrics community? So in the last five years, we actually came up with the idea, which was not no necessarily a novel idea by itself, but the, the way we, we implemented that idea was kind of novel, is what we call multi-spectral multi biometrics, where um, we decided to basically, uh, that since legacy sensors are not designed for presentation attacks, and I don't necessarily mean that they are not completely useful for any kind of presentation attack. So you can still use the iPhone camera to detect Re to, to, to reasonably protect the iPhone or the smartphone, but it might not be good enough for high security buildings or automated border control or a nuclear reactor. So what if we actually can use more than just RGB cameras? So we put together what we call a multi-spectral multi biometric system that include, includes uh, shortwave infrared cameras, regular RGB cameras, near infrared thermal cameras and stereo, stereo pairs, right? And we put all of this in, in, in the design that you see here on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is an actual implementation of that prototype. And we put that system together to test it in terms of uh, biometric uh, detecting presentation attacks against biometric systems, right? Uh, one important uh, aspect of that system is that it had to be extremely 
extremely easy to configure. You don't want to basically spend hours and hours and days to configure such a biometric system, especially if you, if, if you want to use it for multiple biometric modalities, including face, iris, and fingerprint. So what we decided to do is to, make, to, make, is to try to design it in a way that makes it extremely easy to configure using a very simple JSON config, uh, config file, as you see here on the left-hand side. And then the configuration file is read by a microcontroller controller, uh, that basically you can buy off the shelf and that basically uh, collects the data for you. Right? And now, as I mentioned, this is a very simple microcontroller. You can actually buy it off the shelf. This is like $30, $30 microcontroller. Controller. And then in terms of illuminating the, the subject, we also decided to make that extremely modular. So you can use different wavelengths for illuminating the, the, the samples. Uh, you can actually, you can increase or reduce the, the illumination based on the specific use case of that biometric sensor. And then finally, one extremely important aspect of these biometric uh, systems is that if you decide to use multispectral biometrics, you actually have to make sure that the data streams from all sensors are extremely um, synchronized, if you will. Because if, if you're trying to do, for example, face uh, presentation attack detection and the head moves from one frame to the other before you capture the other sensor, then you have uh, uh, major issues in terms of synchronizing the data. And sometimes you cannot actually make sense out of, of uh, uh, asynchronous data streams. So we, we, we made this uh, multispectral biometric sensor uh, extremely uh, synchronous to provide uh, these data streams. And as you can see here, these are basically some samples of biometric data, presentation attack data we collected from faces on the left-hand side, fingerprints on the top right, and irises on the lower right. And as you can see here, collecting data from different sensing modalities like SWIR and uh, near-infrared and thermal gives you rich data streams that you can use later on with data-driven algorithms like neural networks, for example, or CNNs uh, to efficiently do presentation attack detection. Um, the system has been um, thoroughly evaluated by third party. Uh, the, the, uh, the funding agency for this project was IARPA and IARPA contracted Johns Hopkins Applied Physics uh, Lab to do uh, third party independent evaluations of the system. And this is only one sample evaluation that has been going on for the last two years. As you can see here, the, uh, there is a perfect separation for the presentation attack scores. And for the last at least two years, uh, uh, Johns Hopkins APL have not been able to uh, attack our system, regardless of extremely sophisticated attacks they have been, uh, they have been using. One of these attacks, just, just to provoke your curiosity and you can use, I, I don't want to go through the technical details of implementing these attacks. All of this, you can actually read in, uh, in some of our papers is uh, uh, makeup attacks. And makeup attacks is extremely sophisticated. They are used for impersonation, uh, impersonation and concealment. And they are extremely difficult to detect simply because it's very hard to, to, uh, to detect whether uh, a makeup is an attack or just a normal makeup that people you wear on daily basis. But that being said, as I mentioned, the system has been uh, um, evaluated by third party for, for two years now without making a single mistake. So, so this, is, this is on one hand, uh, this basically on one hand solves the problem of uh, legacy sensors of uh, making sure that um, to reduce the attack surface of biometric systems. That being said, so far, given, given what I have presented so far, we haven't solved the problem of continually detecting and learning new presentation attacks. Because you can train the system on a number of, of known attacks and then an adversary will come up with a new attack uh, next week and uh, the adversary can actually detect, can, can actually break into the biometric system. So some of the new work that we just uh, did uh, 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 in the last few months, and this was actually presented 
in ICCV a couple of months ago is, uh, is what we call timeless learning of these presentation attacks. And we basically have three objectives. One is that we want to be, be able to detect uh, known presentation attacks at extremely low false alarm rates. Uh, this, is, this is what we have been doing so far. Number two, we want to be able to detect unknown attacks, even at reduced uh, accuracy, that's still okay. It's much better than zero. And then we want to be able to incorporate these new uh, present newly learned presentation attacks on the fly into the system. And, and this is what we basically have been thinking. This, is, this, is, uh, this figure describes what I just said. You have a data stream. This data stream can be um, a, a mix of bona fide sam samples, uh, known attacks and unknown attacks. And what we want to be able to, to do is to detect bona fide as bona fide, known attack as a known attack, and then an unknown attack as something new we haven't seen before, and then update the model uh, later on. Uh, so this is the architecture that we came up with, and this is what we published in ICCV uh, 2021, just a few months ago. Um, we, we, and I, I forgot to mention that one of the main difficulties, especially for if, you, if we decide to use deep neural networks to, to learn new attacks, is what's, what's, very, what's well known in the machine learning community as uh, catastrophic forgetting. Even if we can detect unknown attacks and we want to uh, retrain the system, we cannot use the whole data set again. We, we need to just, at best, just fine tune with new samples. And if you actually fine tune, uh, you end up over time forgetting what you learned in the first place. So we have not just the, the we, have, we don't just have the problem of detecting unknown attacks or updating the system. We also need to be careful in terms of uh, catastrophic forgetting. And this is the architecture we, that we came up with. We, we added what's, what we call a replay buffer where, uh, and we modeled the problem as an anomaly detection problem, but not, not in a standard anomaly detection problem where you have one, not in a one class, as a one class classification problem. Because the fact is during the initial bootstrapping of the system, we have a mix of bona fides which is the, the in liars class, if you will. And we also know something about known attacks. And then we have the third class, which is the technically the anomaly that we want to detect, which is the unknown class. So we added this replay buffer so that we can continually, uh, uh, as we detect anomalies that, that, uh, consider, that are considered or will be the unknown attacks, we can add them to this replay buffer so that we, when, we, when we fine tune or, re, uh, or, or adapt the model later on, we still, we can avoid catastrophic forgetting. And, and the whole idea is very similar. This is, this is what, I, what I was uh, saying a few seconds ago. We, uh, we basically modeled the problem. Uh, we, we use an encoder, a simple uh, in, in CNN based encoder, and, uh, and it doesn't really matter what the backbone is. I think we used ResNet in the paper, but the backbone really doesn't matter. The whole idea is that we use an encoder and we try to tighten the boundary, the decision boundary around presentation attacks and around another class, which is the bona fides, and then both of them as in liars. And then anything new that, that's basically far away from the decision boundary, which is, the, which is depicted in red here on the right-hand side, will be considered novel or unknown attack. And without going through uh, a lot of details, you can read that in, in the ICCV 2021 paper. We actually have shown in the paper that if you, if you do this, you can actually improve your presentation attack detection accuracy over time. Uh, so now, if Ryan Reynolds from Red Notice 2021 uses his uh, deep fake uh, um, software on his iPad, we can actually efficiently uh, detect that. That being said, what Ryan Reynolds did in Red Notice 2021 is actually easy to detect because what he did is that he created a deep fake on an iPad and then 
presented that iPad to the biometric system as a presentation attack. And given our multispectral um, sensor, biometric sensor, this is relatively very easy to detect using our thermal or 3D sensor simply because uh, the, the thermal sensor will say, this sample does not emit heat and the 3D, the 3D sensor will say, this sample does not have depth in it, even if the deep fake is really good, right? So let's go back to this, right? So what Ryan Reynolds did in, in, in that movie from last year is that he created the deep fake that's a digital attack, right? But at the end, he presented that as a presentation attack, like you see here from the top left arrow from digital attacks into the sensor. That's still considered a presentation attack. It's not that now uh, complicated to detect using our uh, uh, the, 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 the mixture of multispectral sensing and deep neural networks, right? So what's, what's difficult about deep fakes? What's difficult about deep fakes is, let me go back to this. What's difficult about deep fakes and from a biometric systems uh, perspective is if you actually use a deep fake and try to inject it as a digital signal into a biometrics pipeline, which is basically the, the straight arrow from digital attacks into the, 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 the arrow between sensors and feature extraction. That's what, this is what makes, uh, this is one of the reasons why deep fakes are extremely dangerous. And as I said, I'm not going to talk much about deep fakes. Louisa will, will discuss these in details later in the afternoon, right? So uh, deep fakes are actually not, not new. Deep fakes have existed for many, many, many years, maybe even decades in Hollywood. Here you can see, for example, uh, Hollywood replaced Paul Walker after his death, death uh, in Fast and Furious 7. The, the problem is that the studio had to pay $50 million to replace Paul Walker. They hired his brothers and then they, they used computer graphics to replace his faith, face on his brother's uh, uh, bodies, right? So what's new? What's new is that anybody now can produce deep fakes. It does not cost, cost $50 million anymore. If you have a few images of somebody, if you have access to a GitHub repo and a computer with a GPU, maybe even not, you can actually produce a pretty good deep fake. And with that deep fake, you can try to attack a, a biometric system. So um, we designed two generations of deep fake detectors. I would claim that we were first to, to introduce the idea of, inter of temporal integration uh, for deep fake detection, the, the, the work that we that was before our first generation used to essentially just detect whether single frames are fake or not, and just do simple averaging. We, we incorporated the idea of temporal integration into our first generation. And um, back then, the only large scale uh, evaluation data set for deep fake detection was fake face forensics plus plus and we achieved 96% accuracy, that was state of the art, right? And then last year, we introduced the, the second generation of our deep fake detector. And I would just like to highlight the two fundamental innovations here in this pipeline in our second generation. One of them is that this is a two branch pipeline in which one branch uses, uh, one branch extracts representations or features from the RGB signal and one and the new branch that we added basically uh, performs the same thing uh, uh, on the frequency domain. And we, we basically came up with a fully differentiable interpretation of Laplacians of Gaussian, of the formulation of Laplacians of Gaussians so that we basically can train this system into N. So this is, a, as I mentioned, the two branch uh, uh, neural network architecture. And again, we, we added that temporal integration at the end, uh, similar to what we did in the first generation of our deep fake detector. The second really important innovation that we added last year, which, uh, which I will show you later why, why I think this is extremely important, is that we added this idea of large margin loss, where 
the C, the centroid here, the C, basically represents uh, features extracted from bona fide samples from real videos. And then, uh, so, and, and we try to, to push all the representations towards the center of that circle, the green circle. Meanwhile, if we have, during training, if we have samples from, from uh, deep fake videos, we try to push them far away from, uh, from that center of the circle, not just push them far away, but we try to ensure that there is a large margin between the green circle and the, uh, the red circle. This is the second major innovation that we presented last year. And the reason why I think this is important is that this actually enabled us to detect unknown deep fakes that surfaced last year around uh, election time, right? This is a deep fake. I think this is, I think this came from MIT. It was basically showing Nixon saying that the uh, um, um, Apollo mission failed and everybody died on the moon. And as you can see here, the, the, uh, on this particular frame, uh, we show that this frame is actually fake. It looks pretty good, but we were still able to detect it. And the, the red bar on the, on the top shows that we actually did a pretty good job finding that most of this video is actually fake. Similarly speaking, during election time last year, this video came uh, out of nowhere. I can't remember uh, where it came from. It shows uh, the President Russian Putin talking about American democracy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we were also be able we were also able to detect that this is actually a fake video uh, without retraining or fine tuning our system. This is this is completely technically unknown deep fake, unknown attack against uh, our detector, and we were still able to. To detect it, I don't want to go through into numerical results. You can easily find it in the paper, but these uh, visual or qualitative examples are really uh, important to us because, as I mentioned, these are uh, quote unquote out of domain uh, samples. We don't even know how they how these deep fake detectors, uh, deep fake, uh, deep fakes were generated. Okay, so so far I covered pretty much kind of the state of the art, at least from my perspective in terms of biometric systems and deep fakes. So what's next? At least from my perspective, my perspective, I think we had enough sensors. So we really exploited pretty much um, most of the useful sensors we can use for presentation attack detection, uh, shortwave infrared, thermal, et cetera, et cetera, in one version of, of the biometric system we de de developed a few years ago, we actually used uh, lasers as well to detect the blood flow under the skin. It wasn't really helpful in terms of detection rate. So we decided to remove it. So I don't really think that there is a lot of room for improvement from sensing perspective. Okay, so what, what, what is still, what's still there for improvement? I really think that what we really need to start thinking about uh, going forward is what I like to call privacy preserving biometrics. All of the systems we have been developing so far, whether it is presentation attack detection, deep fake detection, face recognition, are all based on samples collected from real people. That's a luxury that's not going to be there for too long. We need to move beyond the idea, not just the idea of using labeled data, right? It's not just about supervision. It's not just about the solution is not simply unsupervised or self-supervised. I think that the, the future is basically without data, period, right? So this paper came from Microsoft a couple of, uh, couple of months ago. They call it fake it till you make it. And they actually created a very clever data set for uh, face pipeline, face processing pipelines. The samples that you can see here are from that paper. This, is, this figure is courtesy of, of the fake it till you make it paper from Microsoft. It's actually pretty good. It's not completely realistic. As you can see here, the faces are not well textured, but at least uh, you, you can see that it's reasonably um, fair in terms of representation of men and women, whites and blacks, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? And it does not violate the privacy of anyone because this is completely synthetic. So, one major aspect of what I like to call privacy preserving biometrics 
is dependency on synthetic data. I really think that the, the age of using real data is, uh, is far behind us. The other, the other aspect of privacy preserving um, biometrics is homomorphic encryption. Uh, this is something that hasn't been used uh, that often in biometrics so far. And for those who are not aware of homomorphic encryption, you can think of it as simply as putting your jewelry in a box, you lock that box and you give the box to the jeweler to fix something. The jeweler will put his hands or their hand in the box, fix it without actually knowing what's in the box and then it will give it to you back. So this is, this is what homomorphic encryption is all about. So the, the, I, I really think the next wave will be, or at least should be, can we actually use these techniques to improve the privacy of biometric systems without too much dependency on personal uh, data? Okay, so this is one part. And then the other part where I see that this, this, this is going to be the future is a combination of continual learning of unknown attacks as I mentioned a few minutes ago in, in our ICCV paper, I did not mean by any means, I did not mean by any means to say that we solved the problem. We are literally scratching the problem of continually, continually learning unknown attacks, detecting and learning unknown attacks. What we haven't even started discussing in our ICCV paper, and I really think that this is uh, one important direction for the community, is also robustness to distribution shifts. That's not, uh, that's not, uh, this is distribution shift and domain shift is a main problem, is a big, is a really big problem in machine learning that's rarely covered in biometric uh, uh, research. And we really need as a community to start focusing on distribution shifts and integrating or starting to think how to actually integrate distribution uh, ro robustness to distribution shifts into our uh, continual learning algorithms. And finally, as I mentioned before, catastrophic forgetting. All of these are problems that will, will start arising in, in the future. And the whole idea or the whole notion that we, we train once and we deploy like pretty much most of the biometric systems that are used now, this is what, what's being done, is, is pretty much long gone. I really think that the future will be something like this. You learn, you deploy, you, and you continue learning and adapting to uh, domain shifts and distribution shifts from, um, from the real world. Something that we have seen uh, firsthand when we actually deploy our systems for testing at Johns Hopkins is that something as simple as changing the camera firmware changes the distribution because simply the firmware is a software that includes digital pre-processing of input data. And once the, the manufacturer changes the, the software or improves the software or fixes a bug, the distribution of the data changes and therefore accuracy of the, the downstream biometric pipelines, whether it is presentation attack detection or face recognition or deep fake detection will actually change. So we need, you need to start thinking about integrating continual learning, domain shift, and catastrophic forgetting uh, uh, algorithms. And then the next big thing that I really think we, we should start focusing on is explainability. Explainability of AI algorithms remains a major challenge from a, from a general machine learning and, uh, and, apply, and uh, artificial intelligence perspective especially in the biometrics community, because it has been kind of overlooked for a long time. There is some work in the biometrics community in terms of explainability, but it's not, uh, the, the focus is not enough, at least from my perspective. And, and this notion that we can just use heat maps to explain AI is not good enough, at least for me, from my perspective. Heat maps, Heat maps are not explainability. You cannot just show these heat maps to a biometric system operator, assuming that there is actually an operator and expect the operator to actually understand and look into these heat maps. Heat maps are not explainability. Explainability, at least from my perspective, should be in natural language and that natural language 
should include semantics where you can actually tell the operator why the, the, the upstream pipeline, machine learning pipeline thinks what it actually thinks. So this work that we, this is, this is new work that we just published in face and gesture two weeks ago, where uh, we, we, we are introducing a new approach to the explainability of face presentation attacks, where we produce natural language. We produce sentences, English sentences that says, as you see here on the top left uh, hand, uh, hand side of the figure, for example, this is the, the, the presentation attack score of that image is one. And the explanation is that this is a shiny plastic mask with green eye shadows. This is, some, this is not a template. This is natural language that we automatically generate to explain the score. So this is, as I mentioned, this is new work that we just published a couple of weeks ago in Face and Gesture. And this is at least from my perspective where the explainability uh, community should go. Now, which is actually is a good uh, sort of segue into what I like uh, to, to, to end my talk with, ethical considerations of AI, ethical artificial intelligence research, right? So this tweet caught my attention. It, it was about two years ago from one of the godfathers of AI, admittedly pioneer of AI, and the, the tweet basically argues that if we have an AI surgeon that we cannot explain, but it cures people at a 90% rate compared to an 80% rate human, do you wanna actually use the AI surgeon uh, or not? Do you want this to be illegal, right? And uh, a few minutes later, another tweet came from another godfather of AI, admittedly another pioneer of AI with all due respect, that basically says, no, you don't want this to be illegal. And I was like, uh, that's problematic to me from an ethical perspective, simply because we have so many problems in the state of the art of AI, where this is just simply wrong. Uh, who's, what, what is the false, false positive rate of that surgeon at 90% cure rate, how, how many people is, are going to die? Uh, who's going to certify it? Who's liable for these false positives? Is it, is it biased against some people or not? Uh, how about confounding factors that we don't know of? Is this AI a surgeon overfitting to the, the training data? How about adversarial attacks and model inversion attacks? Uh, how about poisoning attacks? So we have a large array of AI problems that we are not, um, not willing to admit to the public. And uh, what we're actually doing is creating the extremely dangerous technology that can break the security of biometric systems, sway elections, shame women, exploit children, and can be used for crashing stock markets uh, and at the end, we're we are technically uh, misleading the public. We say things that are not true, simply are just not true. And just last week, this is actually a true story. An AI system created by Amazon for Alexa suggested to a 10 year old to touch a penny to expose plug socket. Thank God nothing happened, the, the child is okay, nobody got hurt, but this is actually the state of AI systems, right? Uh, let alone that we have a massive reproducibility problem. Reproducibility does not mean I will upload my model to GitHub and somebody else will download it and everybody is happy. Reproducibility means I will upload the architecture of the model and I will give you a recipe and you need, and, and everybody should be able to reproduce exactly the numbers I presented in my paper. Otherwise, this is not reproducibility, right? And again, same thing applies to the FDA who's going to certify the surgeon. The FDA will need to reproduce the numbers that any company is going to, that uh, any, any company are going to report before they actually produce an AI surgeon. Right, And then given all of this mis misleading to the public, we end up as a community having 
massive pushbacks. Uh, a few years ago, everybody thought that face recognition is a solved problem and companies like IBM and, and Amazon started actually rolling out face recognition services only to find out that these systems are not accurate. They are biased against black people and many communities and countries and, and counties and states here in the United States started banning the technology completely. So if we are not actually careful about what we uh, present as technologies to the public, we're going to continue having pushbacks and less confidence from the general public to what we do as scientists. And the problem is that we actually think that we did nothing, but we can take the credit for being extremely smart scientists who, that, who created very smart technologies, which is actually not true. We are responsible for what we create, which makes me think, uh, who's to fix this? And I don't think it's only the, the responsibility of machine learning scientists from, from our perspective, we need as a community to start asking what are our, what are our ethical responsibilities in terms of what, what kind of algorithms or systems that we develop or, or, or not develop. And I am not claiming by any means that I have an answer. I really don't have an answer. I really think that this is a question that the community needs to start thinking about carefully and have an open, uh, open and honest debate very similar to the debate in the uh, stem cell that, that the stem cell uh, research community had 20 something years ago right so this is this is i think at least our responsibility as a machine learning community and biometrics community to start asking what is it that we can or cannot do are we allowed to to pursue any research just in the name of curiosity is this good enough and again I'm not claiming to have an answer. I really don't know. And then in terms of governance, uh, I really think the governments need to continue funding research in terms of defending, uh, detecting misinformation, um, improving security of biometric systems, fairness and privacy of these systems. This needs to be, um, uh, this, this needs much more funding from, uh, from governments. And uh, I'm grateful for, uh, again, as I mentioned, grateful for my funding agencies, but I don't think that uh, this is still enough. We still have a lot of problems in AI that needs to be addressed. Um, this is one more aspect of, of the problem. And I also think it's a more, one, one, it could be one more aspect of the solution. I was told by, by an insider from one of the major social networks when I offered to them, my deep fake detector for free last year is that if it will not make money, we don't want, we don't care. It's as simple as this. I was told this upfront. And that's actually a problem because I really think that uh, major social networks, social network platforms like Google or Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn have ethical responsibility. It's not just about making money. Finally, I really think that the school system also has big responsibility where we need to start teaching our kids that um, whatever you see on the internet does not also always mean it's true. And before you actually hit re uh, repost or reshare um, something on your Instagram account or Twitter or Facebook account, you need to think number one about whether this is true or not, whether it is factual or not, whether it is manipulated or not. And number two, if it actually is going to hurt someone or not. Some final thoughts. Um, I really think that the, the, the biometrics community um, needs to look into biometrics and the security of biometric systems as a cat and mouse game, especially things like deep fake detection. There is a lot of rhetoric in some parts of the community that it's an almost impossible to solve problem and gener generation methods now are pretty good and not, nothing can be done. And I am quite frankly against this rhetoric simply because it's just a cat and mouse game. And if we give up, then every single deep fake out there um, will be believable. If we develop systems that, uh, that works at even 50% accuracy, this is much better than, than nothing. 
So this is a cat and mouse game and it's an arms race between people who develop ethical biometric and deep fake detection systems and um, other people, adversaries, right? And finally, um, at least I teach my kids that seeing is not believing anymore. If you see something, you, don't, you cannot believe it right away, at least the way I was raised. Final, my final thoughts is that, my final thought is that ethical AI is not something we actually say. Ethical AI is something we do on a daily basis. Ethical AI is not an algorithm, it's a mindset. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wael, for the very interesting talk. Uh, uh, I myself have an hour of follow-up questions and uh, things to discuss with you about what you said. Uh, so I, I thank you and I'm sure everyone uh, who's attending do too. Um, however, I want to ask first the, the, the attendees if, if someone um, have any notes or questions for uh, why I can see a raised hand from Mahdi. Uh, you can unmute yourself, Mahdi. Uh, no, no, I just wanted to thank uh, well and uh, just uh, yeah, I was, I was to, uh, shaking hands. <laughs> Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Adi. Um, anyone else have a question? I saw a raised hand somewhere, but it disappeared. So I'll move on with, with, with where you uh, actually uh, ended well. Um, you're talking about the ethics in AI um, from our perspective as AI researchers, let's say, and um, um, ethics is usually like philosophically seen from a more of application perspective of uh, the actions that will lead to some consequences. So using, for example, uh, my gun to protect my property against some attacker or using the gun to attack some random person or for malicious use. And, and, and there we see the ethics and not ethics. However, we see in, in AI research, uh, some developments that are very much related. We can, for example, uh, do deep fakes and we can also do uh, de-identification of faces. And uh, the back end is very similar. Uh, it's only like uh, promoted differently. Uh, do you see that it's our responsibility to decide how, uh, our developments are used. I mean, it can be used for good and bad as any other technology. Uh, however, it, it receives a lot of negative uh, um, promotion, let's say. Uh, how do you think we should uh, we'll go on in promoting the back-end technology that we are developing? So, so this is an excellent question, Nasser. And as I mentioned, I really do not have an answer. I would be lying to you if I say I have an answer because this implicitly says I have some moral authority to say what's right and what's wrong, and I don't. But in terms of what you said, whether we are responsible for how the technology we are developing will be used, maybe not, maybe we're not responsible, but at least we are obligated to, th to, to think. All, I, all, I, all I'm asking for, is an honest and open debate in the community. What is it that we are allowed or not allowed to do? Um, there, is, there is a lot of debate out there about stem cells, for, for, for example. And that was, uh, and one of the things that maybe we need to learn from the stem cell community 25 years ago is that they had an open debate. They did not want to hide their uh, problems. Right now, the fact is we do have problems with AI. We do have fundamental issues that we haven't been able to solve in terms of AI. Overfitting uh, adversary, robustness to adversarial attacks, explainability, et cetera, uh, et cetera bias, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And instead of just going out there, let alone, let alone adversarial applica applications like using deep fakes for bad uses, for shaming women, for example. So I am not saying it's necess necessarily our responsibility, but at least we need to think about 
We need to have an open debate, an honest debate, without going to the public and saying, well, everybody's, everything is great, let's just use it. Because it's not, it's really not. Yeah, uh, I see a good move forward is the um, uh, trend in the major AI conferences, NeurIPS, CPPR, and so on, where they specifically ask to discuss the ethical implications of the developed technology. Uh, and this is uh, one step ahead. However, not everybody take it so seriously and we should start to take it uh, seriously. Um, okay, um, well, I will jump in before someone else do. Uh, I agree 100, when you talked about explainability, I agree 100% with you that these heat maps are not explainability. You're not explaining a decision, you know? Uh, it's, it's just something maybe that you can look into while you're developing your solutions. Uh, however, what, what um, I see as is an issue is that uh, there are different users for explainability tools. So there is the user that is, uh, for example, the guy at the border guard who's uh, checking uh, the verification of the faces and wants to know why a face was not matched or why it was matched. And there is also people who are developing algorithms and they want to understand more bigger questions. For example, why um, some algorithm works better on some uh, gender and not on the other. Uh, um, do you see there is a clear taxonomy of user of explainability, users of explainability tool, or is it something that we need? Um, my, my perspective, and I might be wrong, is that explainability itself is an ill-defined problem. I think we need to start by defining what, explaining what explainability actually means, right? And as you said, I agree with you, uh, users of biometric systems will vary. Maybe, I, maybe, maybe, maybe using fingerprint to unlock or, fa or face to unlock smartphone does not need that sophisticated level of a sensor or, or explainability. But meanwhile, if you want to have automated border control or uh, access to nuclear uh, power station, that's another, that, that will require another level of, of explainability. So yes, I agree with you. We need to, 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 number one, we need to have a clear definition of what explainability actually means. And then maybe we can come up with a taxonomy, as you said, of different levels of different users of explainability. Um, for my students and my, my staff, heat maps are pretty good because they actually can tell us what's working and what's not in a, in a machine learning pipeline. Does this mean that for an automated border control, uh, heat maps are good enough? I don't think so. I'm not sure, but I don't think so. I, I, I agree with you. I am not sure also, but I don't think so. Um, any questions from the audience? I see Kieran unmuted. Yeah, I, I wanted to uh, first uh, congratulate you uh, while uh, excellent talk. And the okay. second thing is that I, I like the aspect that you develop the solutions and somebody else test the solutions independently. And this is a continual effort, right? And if the system has not been broken for the last two years, uh, was it last two years? Yes. And then I think it's it's a, it's a pretty uh, good achievement, right? Thank you. Uh, and then the second thing I'm thinking about is, uh, do you think a solution that one solution fits all? Uh, we have multiple problems. You mentioned about deep fakes, you mentioned about adversarial attacks, uh, and all of these problems have independent solutions and each of them have their own problems. Now, if you bring them all together, can we see some, some light in the near future? I do. I mean, um, five, so let me tell you a, a funny story. Six years ago, when I, when I initially wrote the proposal to, to get this biometric work funded, and I, I gave it to my ex-boss in his office, printed version to review it for me, he came a couple of days later to my office, put it on my desk and said, literally said, you're out of your mind. This is not going to work. Six years later, it's actually much better and, and than what we proposed six years ago. It's much more sophisticated. Sensors are much better and the results are much better than we even anticipated when we wrote the proposal. So yes, there is uh, light at the end of the tunnel. 
uh, data-driven algorithms are much more sophisticated now. There is a lot of work in terms of uh, self-supervision and unsu unsupervised methods, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a lot of light at the end of the tunnel. And that's exactly why I don't want to sort of give up to the narrative that uh, deep fakes are undetectable. That's, that's just not scientifically true. I cannot, I cannot even ethically claim that my deep fake detector works 100% of the time. As a scientist, I can say that any deep fake detector system will, will have some false alarms and some false negatives. That's just the nature of things. So I don't want to give up to the narrative that somebody is going to create a deep fake generation algorithm and that will basically work 100% of time. That's just not scientifically, let alone ethically, uh, ethically right. That's why I, I, I want at, at the end of the talk, I said, this is an arms race. This is a cat and mouse game. When people invented computer viruses back several decades ago, with the first virus, people said, well, yeah, computers are broken. We can actually inject viruses into them and we can do whatever we want. But that's not the case decades later. People invent viruses and other people will come up with methods that actually detect these viruses and people will, will break them, et cetera. And, and, and it's just an arms race. So I don't like to think of biometrics or deep fake detection as a one size fits all uh, problem or, or, or a problem that we cannot solve. This is a, a cat and mouse game. And as I mentioned, if we develop a deep fake detector that works at larger scale at Twitter or Facebook scale, that works 50% of the time, to identify misinformation, that's definitely much better than giving up to the idea that these are not detectable and we just live in, in an age where, in an era where truth doesn't exist anymore, simply because if you don't know whether information is, is true or not, truth itself vanishes. Thank you, Vail. Um, I don't know if there are other questions. If there are no other questions, I can follow up uh, one more question with you. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing that you come up with new senses, right? Uh, which kind of solves a lot of different problems. Uh, what is your take on, uh, let's say, the other way? What is the take of authorities on these kind of new senses? Are they willing to deploy it and test it or they want to wait for a few more years until somebody else has tried it? I, I, I cannot speculate on authority whether authorities will actually use it or not. But what I can what I can tell you is that the sensors that we develop are not necessarily for everyday use. Mm -hmm. We're not going to we're not going to add a five thousand dollar shortwave infrared camera to a smartphone. It just doesn't make sense, regardless of price or size, etc. It's just not the right use, right? For for smartphones, just an RGB camera could be good enough with data-driven algorithms to protect the security of the iPhone. But for a nuclear station or automated border control, um, I don't see fi that $5,000 is a big deal. So what I'm trying to say is that biometrics is a spectrum. It's just, it's not, biometrics is not black and white. It's not like that I'm saying every single biometric application has to use our multispectral sensor. That's not accurate. It's not even scientific. Biometrics, is a spectrum. Some people will use, will use very simple sensors like smartphones because what's the big deal? Even if, this, even if it is broken, it's not the end of the world. But meanwhile, if you want to pr protect a nuclear power plant, then maybe, yeah, maybe you need to invest in an expensive sensor to protect the power plant. I think that, that makes uh, more sense on based, choosing the sensor based on the application. Thank you, Vail. Maybe um, there are other questions, Nazar? If I don't see any raised hands. Uh, however, I have rather a technical question from an operator point of view. Um, when whatever operator is using a attack detector, they will set a threshold that is based on uh, false uh, uh, alerts um, most of the time. Uh, however, um, you mentioned something very interesting, which is these up, uh, continuously updated uh, present, uh, attack detectors, whatever are the attacks, and also uh, attack detectors that will deal with different data distributions uh, and the issue of 
data distribution change. Um, for the operator, they will see only the issue of setting the threshold. Uh, is this uh, is setting the threshold uh, for a given false alarm for, for a system that already exists um, is an issue when you update the system? Is this something also we have to work on? I really think this is, I, I, I don't have a, a yes or no answer to this question. I think this is basically um, a, a usage question. My understanding, and I might be wrong, is that most agencies that use these biometric systems have a certain target that they need to achieve. They basically want to make sure that they operate at just a random example, 90% detection rate at 1% or 0.1% false alarm rate. Otherwise, and, and this has to do with the volume of traffic uh, um, uh, around these sensors. So maybe the volume of traffic is massive and they need to have extremely high detection rate at very low false alarm rate. Like for example, uh, um, an airport situation. Other, other situations might be, uh, different where you have access to um, a secure facility or a, or a nuclear power plant where it's not like thousands of people are passing every day. So you can be a little bit lenient in terms of the false alarm rate. That being said, all of the whole process, if a given operator or user knows the operating point, the whole process can be automated. Okay, okay. So, um... My point was about, um, do they have to re-evaluate the system after it's updated so they will set a new threshold? Or do you think the threshold is not much, might not be much uh, affected? Uh, I, I, th this is a two-part question. In terms of yeah. reviewing the system, yes, I am not, I, am, I, I, I don't have enough confidence in the state of the art of AI or biometrics now that basically says deploy, uh, that, that gives me enough confidence to say, deploy a system and don't ever look back. That's just not the state of the art. I really think that these systems need, need, uh, need to be audited and reviewed quite uh, frequently to make sure that the systems are not making enough mistakes. Once you start reviewing, right, you can update your operating points. Maybe the system is working better than you expected and you can actually make your operating point even more uh, stricter. To, to, to ease the burden on operators. Maybe the system is working worse than you expected, right? So it's, it's a matter of the frequency of reviewing these systems. For an airport security situation, you have thousands of people who are passing every day. At some point, at least my understanding is parts of Europe now have automated border control. These systems need to be frequently reviewed to, to make sure that mistakes do not happen at least often. Okay, okay. Maybe a, a research direction for us is to uh, actually uh, expect these changes from, uh, assess these changes from data distribution. This is uh, uh, something that uh, at least I got from your uh, talk and idea. Um, yeah. Any more questions maybe from the audience? If that's if, if if there is no more, I think I don't have more time to talk now to Wael. Uh, Wael, we thank you so much for uh, your presentation. Uh, this was very insightful for me, and I'm sure for everyone here. And uh, hopefully to see you. Uh, hopefully we can see you soon, uh, non virtually. You know. <laughs> we will. <laughs> thank you very much, Wael. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Wael. Thanks. Um, we can move now directly to 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 stick into schedule to our uh, first talk in the uh, first oral session, which is given by Thomas Weringen from Michigan State University. Thomas, you can share your scare screen. Um, the talk is about synthesizing face images from match scores. I think uh, this will be interesting for everyone. You can yes. go ahead. So, so you you guys can hear me and see my screen. Yes. All right, good. So um, my name is uh, Thomas Werengen and I'm from Michigan State University and I'll be presenting our work on uh, synthesizing face images from match scores. 
So a typical face recognition system has two components. The first is a feature extraction stage, which ingests a raw image and outputs a feature, um, provided that it can detect the face. The feature, which is sometimes also called a template, uh, contains the salient details of a face, which are which are useful for for matching, right? Um, and those features, uh, you know, features corresponding to two face images will be compared um, in, the, in that matching stage. And the result of this comparison is a match score. And the match score is a numerical uh, value representing the degree of similarity or dissimilarity uh, between the two faces. And then based on that match score, we can decide um, whether the two faces in the face images match or not. So face recognition systems have grown in use over the last decade. Um, and at the same time, you know, so the interest in the privacy of those face recognition systems um, ha has increased as well. And as part of this interest, you know, many different privacy aspects um, have been explored. Um, much of the interest is focused on the face template itself. And there's other works that show that a uh, face image can be reconstructed from a face template. And not only that, that, uh, Face templates may also contain demographic information like gender or race, which then can then be uh, predicted from the face template as well. But in this work, I'm going to focus on the match scores and explore if a face image can be reconstructed from, from the match scores. Right. So like I said in the previous slide, uh, in this work, we're exploring if a face image can be reconstructed from the match scores. Uh, consider the example on the right. There is a missing face image. Uh, down here on the left uh, of this of this figure, um, there's match scores between um, all of the available face images and match scores even to the missing face image. So we want to reconstruct the face image from this information, and the match scores might offer clues about the appearance of a person. Um, for instance. Um, if it is known that the missing face image has a similarity match score of 0 0.2 with Alice and 0 0.6 with Bob then we can infer from that information as if missing inf the missing face will look more like Bob than Alice. Um, with additional match scores, we might be able to reconstruct the, the face image. So in this work, we evaluated um, uh, if, the, if a missing face image can be deduced from match scores and some available face images. And we will pr we propose and evaluate two approaches. The first is a face mixing approach, and the second is a convolutional autoencoder approach. The two um, approaches are not completely uh, separate. Uh, the convolutional autoencoder approach uses the output of the face mixing approach as input. The face mixing approach generates a face by using a weighted average of some imposter images. The convolutional autoencoder approach will take a mixed face as input and further refine it. So to define our problem a little further, suppose we have a set X consisting of N face images where each individual face is on X sub two and so on. A matrix M takes two faces, X sub I and X sub J and outputs a similarity score S um, or S sub I J. Um, and we know that the similarity score between all pairs of images, which we collectively refer to as the set S. Then the goal for this work is if a face image X sub T goes missing, um, can we reconstruct this uh, missing face image um, from the remaining information? So the first approach, what we call the face mixing approach, averages images together to generate a missing face image. We first select the input images by finding the index of images which are above some threshold tau. Right here. We've if there are more than k such images, then we only retain the images corresponding to the k largest match scores. Once we select the input images, we create a mixed image by taking the weighted average, um, as you can see down here, of all the unaligned input face images. The output, which we're calling x tilde t, is given by the equation um, down here, right? And it simply um, combines the input images by averaging, by averaging them together. The second approach, which we call the convolutional autoencoder approach, further refines the mixed image. The convolutional autoencoder loss function is trained with a two-part loss function. Um, the first part, which we call the per pixel loss, compares the output of the convolutional autoencoder, which we denote as x hat t, to the real image xt. The second part, which we call the identity loss, 
compares the face features of XHAT T and XD. The face features are from a VGG face network. Together, these two loss functions form the overall loss function. The result is a trained convolutional autoencoder, which takes a mixed face, which we denote X tilde T as input and outputs a further refined face image X hat T. Um, in our work, we use two frontal face image data sets. The first is the biome data set, which has approximately 1600 images of 240 subjects. The second is a proprietary data set called PROP, which has approximately 2,200 images of approximately 1,100 subjects. Both data sets are split into five folds in the subject disjoint manner, so we can perform experiments using cross-validation. For the bi biome data, data set, each fold has 48 subjects and 318 to 320 images. For the PROP data set, each fold has 219 or 220 subjects and 400, um, approximately 440 uh, images. So in our work, we use two face matchers uh, for our experiments. The first is the ARC face matcher, and the second is a commercial face recognition SDK, which we denote uh, as COTS. The, the, the ARC face matcher is used to select the input images. The COTS matcher is then used to evaluate the generated face images by comparing the generated face image and the real uh, face image. In our experiments, um, we generate um, face images using the mixed approach and the convolutional autoencoder approach, which we abbreviate to the um, approach in some places. Our experiments compare the generated face image to the real face image, and results are reported using five-fold cross-validation. We evaluate with two values of tau, 1.1 and 1.2, and k equals to 10. For the convolutional autoencoder approach, we equally weight the per pixel loss and the identity loss. First, we look at the success at generating images. The right two columns in the table over here uh, report the generation success and the extraction success. A successful generation means there were enough images above the threshold to create a mixed images and run it through the convolutional autoencoder. The first thing I wanna draw your uh, attention to is that if the threshold tau increases, then the generation success decreases. This is because there are fewer imposter images above the threshold, meaning in some cases, there are zero images from which to create a mixed image. A successful extraction means the face can be uh, detected by COTS and the generated uh, image, and thus a template can be extracted with the COTS matcher. The second thing I want to bring your attention to is that a COTS template can be extracted for nearly any generated image. And the last thing I want to point out um, is that there is little difference between the mixing approach and the convolutional autoencoder approach in terms of generation success and extraction success. Moving on, next we'll look at the matching performance. For this experiment, we see how often the generated image can be matched to the real image using COTS. For this, we first calculate the threshold corresponding to a 1% false match rate, which is 0.405 for biome data and 0.25 for prop. The first thing to notice with this slide is that the convolutional autoencoder with tau equals to 1.1 on the biome data set had the worst performance, and the mixed approach with tau equal to 1.2 on the prop data had the best performance. Overall, the mixed approaches had a higher acceptance rate compared to the convolutional autoencoder approach. Additionally, the acceptance rate was higher when tau was 1.2 compared to 1.1. So next I have a couple of example images of what the input images are selected to generate a mixed face image. So you can see that in the two rows here on the, on the left. The two rows of face images on the left are those input images and the mixed image and the real image are here on the right. In this example, the COT score between the, the, the real image and the mixed image is 0 0.952, which is quite high. Lastly, I have an example of some of the generated images. The leftmost image is the real image, and the right four columns show the mixed images and the convolutional autoencoder images with tau equal to 1.1 and 1.2. You can compare the mixed images and the convolutional autoencoder images and see why the mixed images were more successful in 
in general compared to the convolutional autoencoder images. The mixed images are blurry, but they still have a higher quality appearance compared to the convolutional autoencoder images, which you can see have a blocky appearance. So to summarize, we evaluated the use of match scores to deduce a missing face image, and our experiment showed that indeed the missing face image can be generated with some success. We also saw that the mixing approach was more successful compared to the convolutional autoencoder approach. As well, we saw the, the higher threshold resulted in more successful generated images. As a possible future work, we might directly incorporate the match scores into the generation process, um, possibly with a graph neural network. And that's it for me. Um, does anyone have any questions? Thank you very much, Thomas, for interesting work. Uh, anyone have questions before? I have few, a few whys and what ifs, but uh, anyone else have a question, please just unmute and ask your questions. If it's not the case, uh, I want to ask you, why did you choose this K? Why did you choose? Uh, only a certain number, a fixed number of uh, comparison images to include in your generation? Uh, yeah, the reason we did that is if you select any amount of images, mm -hmm. eventually if you have, you, you'll get too many images. And so basically what you get is just an average face of, of, of the data set rather than something that looks specifically like the, uh, person you're trying to, or the yeah. face image you're trying to reconstruct. Okay, okay. And and um, you came up with K equals 10. Is this depending also in on, on N on like... Um, yeah, we, well, we tried N it with, a, N, you know? we tried yeah. it with a couple different values uh, mm -hmm. um, and 10 seemed to work the best. We tried it with three and I think we tried it with 15. Um, okay. and, and 10 was had the best results. Okay, okay. And you have these two databases where uh, not KN is different. So you have a different amount of comparisons, right? Yes, yes. Uh, and and um, for both, K was the same, the optimal, let's say. Yes. Uh, well, uh, I think we, you know, evaluated them on one data set and then okay. Uh, uh, you know, just applied those results to the to the other data set. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, one uh, just a thought that I must uh, I can mention about the selection of K. Uh, your assumption yeah. is that the face is defined, but by the faces that are similar to it. That's why you choose K. But it can be also the case that the face is defined by the faces that are similar and the faces that are unsimilar to it, like. Um, you know what I mean. It, it you can define a yeah, face. Yeah, or... you can say you, you have both. You have um, a comparison of both directions. You can say it looks like someone else, but doesn't look like this person. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have like like if you were talking about a graph, you'd have almost like a negative edge. Um, yeah. That I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, and that we kind of hope to do something more sophisticated um, in upcoming works, and that's definitely something we'll look at. Okay, thank you. It, it's just uh, a thought. It's not a, a criticism. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I can see one uh, question from Beam Fu. Beam, you can just unmute yourself and, and ask if you would like. Oh, I, I, I see your question. Um, so uh, the K images are not from K different imposters. But um, for especially for the uh, one of the data sets, there's only two images per subject, and the average number of input images um, it depends on what the tau value was, but it was either five or eight. So there's more than one subject um, per uh, per generated face. Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, I had also a question on something in in slide fourteen. Okay. You can jump 14. to it. I had just written a note slide 14, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yes, I know what I'm talking about now. Um, the FMR threshold for the two databases is, is quite different. We know that these thresholds are not um, really linear with the implication of them of, or the comprehension of the threshold, 
but they are quite different. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the difference of nature between the two databases? Maybe one of them is so much uh, controlled or something. The, well, they're both uh, controlled frontal face image captures. You know, they were taken by biometric both cap are um, collected by biometric scientists um, in a controlled capture setting. So yeah, we noticed that too, where the threshold is drastically different, even though the um, the capture conditions don't seem to be very different. Like if you were, I don't know if I have an example, uh, or I, do, I don't, because the proprietary, we can't show examples mm -hmm. from, but um, the biome data set and the prop data set, if you were to look at the images, I mean, the background is different, because they were collected by different um, institutions, but the you know the appearance in terms of pose, you know illumination, um, uh, you know they 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 look very similar. Okay, and and uh, follow up small follow up on that. Uh, uh, when you collect this um, percentage on the right, the test uh, the accepted test images, um, are they based on the comparison with the image that was supposed to be there? or with an yes, image yes. Of, the, of another image of the identity that was there, you know what I mean? It's the uh, image that was supposed to be there. Okay, the image itself. So, okay. yes, yes. Okay, but it's, it's, it's very interesting work. And, and I think uh, um, maybe even some technical uh, updates on, on the autoencoder can get you a very uh, much better looking image, I would say. Uh, yes, I think so too. However, as a, it's very interesting. Any more questions? Kieran, I see you unmuted. Yeah. Thomas, uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I have one question, maybe I missed it. Uh, the question is uh, regarding the images that you showed. Most of them are in grayscale. Was it a reason? Was there a reason behind that? Or is it just the illustration images? Um, the images that we worked with, they were originally in color, but we uh, converted them to grayscale. Um, to make mixing them and generating them a little bit, a little bit easier. I see. Um, and then I have a second question. I, I don't know, maybe you mentioned it, I missed it. Uh, how, how did you manage to generate these templates from the um, COT systems? Most of these COT systems have their own proprietary templates, right? Yes. Um, so we don't have access to the COTS template. The, and the COTS matcher we only used for evaluation. So the generation side, we used the arc face matcher mm -hmm. um, to do um, to decide what uh, what uh, you know, images to mix, and then once we've generated an image, the comparison is done with a COTS matcher. So it's a different matcher that's using to decide what to mix, mm -hmm. and a separate matcher that's deciding whether how, the quality of the uh, generated image. So do you have any intuition on if you just post-process those images, let's say applying some sharpening filters or um, median filters kind of uh, operations, would that improve the match scores? Um, I, we did not do any kind of post-processing experiment to see um, if it improves anything, but I wouldn't expect it to change the match scores dramatically. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Thank yes, you so thank much, you very much. If I don't see any more questions, uh, then I would like to thank you again and we move forward on time to the next speaker, who is uh, Enderjeet Singh from NEC, who's presenting powerful physical adver adversarial examples against practical face recognition systems. Uh, Enderjeet, you can share. Yes, we can see your slides. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yes, perfect. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm Indrajit uh, Singh from uh, NEC Secure System Research Laboratories, Japan. And uh, our paper is on uh, powerful physical adversarial examples against uh, practical face recognition systems. Yeah, so uh, our goal in this work is to strengthen physical uh, attacks for real world risk assessment for practical face recognition uh, systems for the risk assessment. We propose a novel smoothness loss and a patch noise combo attack method. The motivations uh, behind uh, this work includes uh, 
uh, the fact that uh, uh, traditional smoothness loss suffers from the uh, problem of causing less control, uh, controlled smoothness constraints on uh, adversarial optimization process. And also they, does not, uh, they do not allow selective smoothening inside the adversarial noise region for complex real world patterns. Also the uh, conventional uh, adversarial patch attacks do not consider combining adversarial noise generated considering uh, different constraints from a, uh, for a powerful physical attack. So we will start with the uh, introduction. Now, what are adversarial examples? An adversarial example is an uh, instance with small intentional feature perturbations uh, uh, that cause a machine learning model to work in a certain false way to achieve adversary's objective. So in this example, we can see uh, uh, the adversarial noise is in the form of uh, uh, eyeglass. And when uh, this noise is added to a clean face image, it causes the misclassification by a target face recognition system. Early works in adversarial machine learning studied uh, adversarial examples in the digital space only. And in this work, we focus mainly on physical adversarial examples under the physical image registration attack setting. Now, what are physical adversarial examples? So when a digital adversarial example is transferred uh, to the physical world uh, by printing, painting, and then used to attack a target system from the physical world, then it is called physical adversarial examples. The figure on the right basically shows the some well-known physical adversarial attacks. However, uh, the attack performance in the physical world has been relatively lower than the digital world. Now, physical image registration attacks. Physical image registration attack is an uh, uh, so in physical image registration attack, an adversary submits uh, a printed uh, adversarial image during the registration process uh, that causes uh, a mistake by the face recognition system during the inference. Uh, for such attacks, uh, the target system includes a uh, person re-identification, automatic ID document, uh, photo matching systems at international borders, etc. Now we will see some key terms. So uh, on the basis of uh, the information access to the target face recognition system, uh, the attacks are mainly uh, divided into two categories, uh, white box attacks and the black box attacks. There are also gray box attacks when the adversary has some uh, partial information about the target system. So when an attack is uh, generated using the full information access to the target face recognition system, then that uh, generated attack is called white box adversarial attack. But when uh, an adversary do not have any information about the target face recognition system, in that case, most of the time, uh, adversary use a surrogate face recognition system to generate uh, uh, an adversarial attack and then use that generated adversarial attack to target the uh, target face recognition system, which is uh, FRS2 in this uh, example. The ability of a successful white box adversarial example to succeed on a black box model is called transferability or black box transferability. And uh, there is another term, physical transferability. And physical transferability is the ability of a successful digital adversarial uh, example to fool a target system from the physical world. There are some challenges for the success of physical adversarial examples. Uh, the success of physical adversarial examples primarily depends on the physical reconstruction losses. Physical reconstruction loss is, uh, is the total amount of information lost and the noise added to the physical adversarial example while transferring it from the digital world. Uh, it comprises uh, the printing errors, uh, camera noises, change in camera angles, variable lighting conditions, attack surface characteristics, and the realism. For a uh, better attack performance in the physical world, existing works uh, tried reducing the physical reconstruction losses. To reduce physical reconstruction losses, existing uh, approaches focus on generating smoother adversarial patterns. 
no, existing smoothness laws. So Sharif et al. introduced a smooth uh, smoothness penalty, which minimized the total variation. And uh, uh, this is the equation, uh, uh, the given uh, smoothness loss by Sharif et al. So in, in their proposed smoothness loss, basically they minimized uh, the uh, total variation or the variation uh, pixel difference between the immediate pixel pairs in the adversarial noise region. They increased the smoothness uh, of the patch, thereby improving the inconspicuousness and uh, physical realizability. However, uh, the loss suffered from some limitations. Uh, the first one was uh, it uh, caused substantial smoothness constraints on the adversarial optimization process. And it also uh, caused restriction of possible practical patterns in the generated adversarial examples due to excessive smoothness constraints. And uh, also, it uh, did not allow uh, did not allow selective optimization in the adversarial noise region. So here is our uh, first contribution: a novel smoothness loss. We propose a uh, smoothness loss based on an activation threshold uh, that causes calculation of total variation only for the pixel pairs having deviation greater than that uh, activation threshold from an initial reference value. So in, in this equation, uh, Pij is the difference in the value of a pixel uh, from a reference value, which is predefined at a location Ij in the adversarial noise region. M is a dynamic mask that activates the smoothness loss for the pixels with intensities greater than a predefined threshold matrix Z. Now, working of existing versus our smoothness loss. The existing smoothness loss starts penalizing uh, total variation right from the beginning of attack generation process, hence it uh, causing excessive regularization constraints on the adversarial optimization process. Our smoothness loss causes delayed smoothness uh, regularization during attack generation process due to the use of activation-based uh, threshold-based activating mask. Uh, for the total uh, variation calculation. The use of threshold-based uh, activating uh, mask calculates total variation only for the noise pixels with uh, the most active gradients, hence allowing selective optimization in the adversarial noise region. Our second, uh, second contribution is a patch noise combo attack. So uh, existing works focus on generating adversarial noise coming from a single distribution or environment of similar constraints only. To generate stronger adversarial examples for face recognition systems in the registration attack setting, we combined an adversarial patch in the form of eyeglass uh, with an imperceptibly small noise as shown in this figure. So uh, basically this, uh, this is the adversarial noise. Uh, so this, uh, this is the adversarial eyeglass noise. And uh, in the remaining uh, reason of this image, basically there is imperceptibly small noise. And that uh, noise is added uh, to the face image. Uh, in our case, we use uh, the following equation to add uh, this adversarial noise to this face image. Now experiments, uh, to show the effectiveness of our method, uh, we used uh, state-of-the-art pre-trained face feature extractors, uh, white box attack algorithms, and black box attack transferability techniques. Uh, the target domain uh, for our evaluation was uh, uh, digital as well as the physical. And the adversarial objective was the impersonation attacks. For uh, each attack combinations, uh, each, uh, we generated 100 adversarial examples for the digital evaluation and a subset of uh, 10 adversarial examples for the uh, physical evaluation. Now, physical adversarial example generation pipeline. 
So uh, to generate and evaluate physical adversarial examples, first we uh, generated digital adversarial example, then those digital adversarial examples are printed and captured. Uh, while printing and capturing, we consider different uh, brightness levels and uh, uh, different uh, light temperatures, light color temperatures. And uh, then that uh, captured data was cleaned and uh, then the face detection and alignment on the captured images were uh, performed to feed uh, them to target face recognition systems uh, system for the feature matching. Finally, the success of uh, the attack was checked using a distance-based and uh, cosine-based uh, thresholds. Results for the digital adversarial attacks. So uh, the figure on the left uh, shows the results for the white box digital adversarial examples and uh, the figure on the right uh, shows the results for the black box digital adversarial examples. So from these uh, from the left figure we can see that the for uh, our smoothness uh, for our smoothness loss uh, the performance of our smoothness loss was uh, almost similar to the no penalty case. So no penalty case is basically the adversarial examples generated without using any additional regularizer. So which, which is uh, uh, since the additional regular, uh, regularizer make uh, adds uh, additional constraints on the adversarial optimization process and uh, make uh, it difficult to generate successful digital adversarial examples. So uh, we can see that our smoothness loss do not cause a, a large reduction in the digital white box attack success rate. For our noise combo attack, because of the uh, because of the significant increase in the feasible solution space, we can clearly see there was a significantly higher uh, attack success rate for the white box case compared to the uh, existing total variation based uh, um, minimization based technique. For the black box, uh, for the black digital black box case, uh, we can see that our smoothness loss as well as uh, the noise combo attack uh, clearly outperformed uh, its uh, their respective baselines. Now, results for the physical adversarial attacks. So the physical uh, the difference in the performance for the physical domain, uh, both for the white. Uh, white box as well as black box case uh, was significant and uh, both our smoothness loss as well as our the uh, noise combo attack significantly outperformed the respective baselines for the white box as well as black box case from the experimentation we also found that the total variation present in the generated adversarial examples from the existing and our smoothness loss was similar. Uh, so basically to ensure that the final amount of uh, uh, smoothness generated in the uh, adversarial examples uh, were similar. Also, uh, total variation in the adversarial examples generated using the smoothness regularizer was significantly lower. Uh, than the adversarial example generated without smoothness regularizer. There was a significant physical transferability increase for our patch noise combo attack. We also evaluated the relation of change in the physical attack success rate uh, and imperceptibility, uh, imperceptibility with the increasing size of adversarial noise. And uh, uh, we found that the adversarial noise, the size of adversarial noise is directly proportional to the physical attack success rate. Uh, and it was uh, imperceptibility, uh, uh, inversely proportional to the imperceptibility. So to conclude our work, uh, uh, in this paper, we proposed a novel smoothness regularizer and a patch noise combo attack method for generating powerful physical adversarial examples against practical face recognition systems. Our smoothness loss allows generating much complex uh, real world adversarial patterns. Our patch noise combo attack provide, uh, provide significant physical attack success rate improvement. From the physical world, uh, world evaluation, we conclude that the size of imperceptible noise has a trade off of attack success rate and physical imperceptibility. 
the generated digital and physical adversarial examples from our method allows an adequate risk assessment for the practical face recognition systems. So that's all uh, from my side. So thank you for your attention. Please proceed uh, with your questions. Thank you very much, Antarjit, for an interesting talk. Uh, any questions? If it's not the case. I have a couple of things that I want to clarify for myself. Um, in general, in your work and in previous work addressing the, the, the physical adversarial uh, attacks, um, do you consider um, a, a biometric, for example, if we're dealing with biometrics, a biometric sample uh, that was that the attack was introduced to it in the digital space? So it's it's a face image that you put the attack on it, and then you print it, or you consider a printed attack, so physical adversarial attack that is placed on a physical face, so a real face. And, and is there a difference between these two cases? Yes, so uh, we perform, actually, we considered a uh, image registration setting. So in a registration-based attack, the whole uh, picture uh, is printed as it is, whole face picture. So it's not like uh, cutting the eyeglass frame only and then uh, pasting uh, and actually we are uh, by some uh, like person in the in the physical world so in the registration attack setting we basically we printed and then uh, captured those uh, printed pictures uh, from uh, for the physical evaluation okay okay uh, uh, was there previous work that considered the case where you uh, have a real face uh yes i'm just asking okay and and yes. can you give us just an idea of what is the effect of that uh effect uh, you mean uh, in the in in terms of attack on the attack success yeah uh, attack success yeah so uh so from uh so in in the papers the attack success uh compared to the digital attack success rate uh, is is significantly lower but but they can still fail. So for example, uh, for a uh, hundred percent uh, attack success rate uh, in the digital domain, the existing works uh, actually it, it is highly variable depending upon the uh, it it varies uh, with identity to identity, and uh, so the range of uh, attack success rate in the physical domain has been reported around in between twenty to maybe sixty percent in some cases. Okay. Thank you. Um, a quick question on slide eight, just to clarify things also for myself. Uh, if you can move to slide eight, then I yeah. can. So in slide eight, you defined, uh, while you're moving, you defined uh, three problems that the uh, state of the art solutions uh, have. Uh, I want you, if, if possible, to tell us shortly, so we know where did your solution focus, uh, which of these did you provide a solution to, and how well did it work? Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, could you repeat your question, please? Uh, yeah, so in, in slide eight, you had one, two, three. These are the three problems with state of the art, right? Yes. yes. Uh, um, which of these three problems did your solution target and how well did it solve this problem? Yes, so we uh, target all these uh, limitations and uh, I, I won't say that we have solved completely them, but we have provided improvements like significant improve, uh, improvements for uh, all these limitations. Okay. So, for example, uh, there, there, there was problem of uh, uncontrolled excessive smoothness constraints. So we basically solved that problem using the delayed adversarial uh, smoothness uh, uh, constraints. And uh, also to allow selective smooth uh, optimization. So selective optimization means uh, uh, you want to smoothen only the some target areas uh, in the noise region instead of uh, smoothing the entire uh, adversarial noise region with same uh, with same scale so basically the use of activation uh, threshold matrix 
also allows you uh, so that targeting only specific regions in the adversarial noise. Okay, thank you very much, Interjit. Um, any questions from the attendees? Uh, Indajit, uh, thank you for the uh, talk. Uh, I just have a, um, it's not a question, more of a um, thought. Uh, we we also evaluated this work from uh, Sharif et al. in uh, from 2016 publication. Uh, one of the things that we noticed is that these attacks or this this uh, this generation of attacks, let's say, not specific for their attacks, um, these adversarial attacks are typically vulnerable only for the deep learning based systems. And most of the COT systems, they are not so vulnerable. Uh, did you observe something similar or was your experience completely different? Uh, so uh, apart from deep learning, uh, deep learning based systems, uh, we haven't evaluated them uh, on other systems. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the deep learning based systems, they are highly tra transferable. So basically, uh, it depends on the how similar uh, how similar the networks are, mm -hmm. and uh, so depending on the, uh, there is like transferability property. And uh, if, if, if even uh, within deep learning uh, based uh, deep learning models, if there is a significant difference in the architecture, for example, if there is large difference in the model sizes, mm -hmm. the transferability is very low. So, so yeah. So basically, it depends on uh, how similar the models are and uh, what are the representative features they uh, for, for them for each model. I see. Thank you. And and just just a follow up question is um, if you look at two complementary architectures, is the attack that you proposed equally um, equally good for these complementary architectures or? you ought to somehow optimize these attacks based on every single architecture. Yes, so uh, there are some hyperparameters uh, uh, for this attack. So for example, uh, one hyperparameter is the reference uh, reference point uh, mm -hmm. we want to use and uh, how much uh, the size of noise we want to uh, like allow, for example, the epsilon based uh, L infinity constraints and Apart from that, uh, uh, I think, yeah, so these are the only hyperparameters and these methods are uh, can be used uh, with any architecture or any system if, if the objective is to smoothen or, or attack from the physical world. Thank you, Indrajit. Thank you, Terjit, a lot. And uh, we can move uh, to the next presentation or I see maybe someone will have a question. Hello, uh, if may you I can ask do a it question? Fast. Yeah, please. A quick question. Uh, uh, hello, uh, thanks for the interesting talk. I have a question on the slide 13. Um, so in the registration setting, uh, if you want to impersonate another person, does that mm -hmm. mean you need to have access to that uh, person you, you want to impersonate? Yes. So uh, to generate uh, impersonation attack, uh, it, it uh, it requires the uh, basically the face image uh, of the target person. Is there a direction or research that uh, you can kind of impersonate uh, an arbitrary person rather than uh, some targeted person? Because I think in practice, it will be difficult to uh, acquire uh, the person you want to impersonate unless you have some cooperation from that person. Uh, so yeah, so to uh, impersonate an arbitrary person, the main uh, problem is like how how we are going to evaluate uh, in, in, in that case. So there are evasion attacks. Uh, so evasion attacks basically uh, causes, uh, uh, makes the deep features very less similar to the original face image. And then those deep features can like move in any direction. They can copy any other identity but it is not like guaranteed that they will actually move in the latent space of uh, some other identities. So yeah, the problem is uh, like how, how can we evaluate? I haven't seen any uh, paper which uh, actually does that. As you just mentioned, it's very interesting problem actually. Uh, like, uh, we, uh, like one uh, test identity can be defined and then uh, so, yeah, so I haven't seen any such work yet. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank, Thank you, you very much, Inderjeet. Uh, we can move now to the next presentation, the last presentation in this session by uh, Puria uh, Agdai from West Virginia University, who will present morph detection enhanced by structured group sparsity. Uh, Puria, you can share your screen. Yes. So uh, may I play my uh, recorded uh, pr presentation? Um, we can do that if you'd like. OK. Let me one second find it. Share. One second. Somehow the somehow Zoom cannot find the display. Nazar, I don't think there is sound. It's not working, uh, Kira? No, th there is no sound. There is no sound. Should be working. Let me do it again. The contents of our presentation are as follows. First, we introduce the problem. Second, morphed image detection is discussed after that methodology experiments and results are explained. Detection of morphed images is of great significance in high throughput border control applications. A morphed image in the middle is generated using genuine face images from two different individuals. Since the resulting morphed image inherits the characteristics of both subjects, it can be verified against both real subjects. Morphed images are usually generated using two approaches. In the first approach known as landmark-based morphing method, two real face images are alpha blended in order to create a morphed image. To eliminate the ghosting effects in the morphed image, the average of the landmarks in both real images is used as the resulting landmark of the morphed image. In the second technique of the facial image morphing, a generative model, which is a generative adversarial network, is trained to uh, synthesize morphed images. Um, for detection of morphed images, some of the previous research efforts um, adopted handcrafted features such as BCIF, SERF, SIFT, or LBPH um, to detect morphed images. In this work, we employ um, group sparsity as a feature selection a scheme to improve the performance of the 
<coughs> deep morph detector. We first convert RGB images into the wavelet domain and the group sparsity constraint is added to the loss function of our deep neural network, which implicitly picks the most discriminative wavelet subbands. As uh, mentioned, uh, all the input images are um, converted into wavelet subbands. So uh, since the morphing artifacts lie in the high frequency spectrum, we do not consider the low low subband in the first level of decomposition to be decomposed further. Instead, we decompose low high, high low and high high subbands in the first level of decomposition. And after three level of decomposition, we get 48 subbands for each image. Uh, in this study, we use three data sets, VSAP17, LMA, and Morgan, and we do uh, subband selection based on all three data sets combined, which is called universal data set. We train a deep neural network with the training portion of the universal data set. And uh, in this deep neural network, the loss function includes a group sparsity constraint on the weights of the first convolutional uh, layer, which implicitly selects the most discriminative wavelet subbands. We evaluate the performance of the trained deep neural network on the validation set of the universal data set, which leads to selecting the most optimal value for the group sparsity coefficient Uh, so since the wavelet subbands are input of our deep neural network, our group sparsity constraint in the loss function of our deep neural network is a, a, actually a constraint on the weight of the first convolutional uh, layer. After training our deep neural network, 20 uh, most discriminative wavelet subbands are selected as shown in this picture. And uh, as I mentioned before, this subband selection is done based on the universal data set. However, we use these 20 discriminative subbands to train separate deep neural networks for each data set, but, and we evaluate performance of the train deep neural networks for each data set. This is, in this equation, uh, you see the re our regularized loss function of our deep neural network, which includes the classification loss, which is a binary cross entropy loss. And, uh, uh, and the group sparsity constraint on the uh, weights of the uh, first convolutional layer. Lambda represent the group sparsity coefficient, and uh, C represent the number of channels, N is the number of filters, H and V represent the uh, heights, um, uh, the dimensions of the kernel in each uh, uh, channel. So, uh, Based on this figure, um, the lambda uh, equal to 0.003 represents the highest performance when our trained deep neural network is evaluated on the validation set of the universal data set. So uh, the red curves is the optimal value for our hyperparameter lambda. In this figure, you see a summarized um, you see a, a summarized um, our methodology is summarized in this figure. 
which shows that uh, 48 wavelet subbands are fed into a deep neural network, which has a constraint, group sparsity constraint on the uh, weights of the first convolution layer. After that, 20, um, uh, after that, after training the deep neural network, 20 most discriminative wavelet subbands are selected, and then a morph detector is um, is trained for each different data set. So the data sets in this study are VZAP17, Morgan, and LMA. Uh, and the, our deep neural network is Inception ResNet V1. And the size of our universal data set is as follows in the training set of the universal data set, there are 1,631 bona fide and 1,183 morphed samples. The validation set of the universal data set consists of 462 bona fide and 167 morphed subjects. The test set of the um, universal data set includes 1,631 bona fide and 1,183 morphed images. So in this um, slide, you see the DET curve when our morph detector is trained on the universal data set in the left figure. And in the right figure, the DET curve is when our morph detector is trained on the on each data set separately. Based on the right figure, our morph detector shows a very good performance uh, on the VZAP17 and Morgan data set, which means that uh, most of the morph images in these two data sets are detected. Also, the results of our uh, morph detection uh, is summarized in these two tables. The left table shows the uh, performance of our morph detector when it is trained on the universal data set. And in the right table, the performance of our morph detector when it is trained on the individual, trained and ev evaluated on the individual data sets. Uh, as you can see, for the VZAP17 and the Morgan, the results are very good. To show the functionality of our deep morph detector, we adopted GradCam visualization um, to see which regions are uh, focused by our morph detector to label an input image as bona fide or morphed. In the left column, you see the uh, GradCam visualization for the bona fide images. And in the right column, you see the GradCam visualization for the morphed images. Finally, we uh, employed TSN visualization to uh, prove the uh, functionality of the uh, subband selection. In the left figure, uh, a subset of the uh, Morgan data set is uh, visualized uh, for both bona fide and morph classes using TSN. The same um, subset of the data set is visualized in the right figure, but in the right figure, um, subband selection is performed on the data set. As you can see, the uh, in the right figure, the, uh, the, data, uh, the data points have become more separable compared to the left figure, which proves that our subband selection improves the morph detection, uh, improves the performance of our deep morph uh, detector. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Puria. Uh, if we have any questions from the audience, then I will ask you something. Uh, you select these 20 subbands and you say that they help actually uh, uh, enhance the, the performance. Uh, and you select them based on how discriminant are they between attacks and bona fide, right? <clears throat> Sorry. So uh, my feature selection method is uh, based on the group sparsity. So uh, by the end of the training, um, some of the kernels are uh, zeroed out. So those corresponding uh, wavelet subbands are discarded and um, the remaining wavelet subbands are used for retraining the network. And why 20? Like just a parameter or uh, after the so after training with the selected hyperparameter uh, i mean first i selected the coefficient uh, lambda which is for the group sparsity coefficient and uh, after training uh, 20 wavelet subbands were remained there is no logic behind that so uh, Okay, and um, in your results somewhere in the slide, it was shown that when you are detecting the LMA attacks, the, the, the attack detection work worse when you actually trained on the same data, on, on the training set of the same data, uh, than when you had the universal training. Uh, do so you have any uh, intuition of why is that? So you're talking about the uh, separate data, I mean, individual data sets? I'm yes, right. when, when you had this ROC with universal LMA versus LMA, LMA. OK. Yeah. Uh, so, the result, so when the training data set is uh, uh, universal, the results are better. I think it's because the, in the training set, there are uh, Morgan and Vizap data set, and there is somehow the generalization. I mean, sorry, uh, perhaps the detector uh, performs better uh, when okay. it sees uh, more diverse data set in the training. But that's only for LMA. It was that's why I'm asking if you have any intuition of why is that. Um, yeah. So the. Uh, yeah, so the results on, on the LMA are uh, worse than the other data sets. I think it's because the uh, uh, morph, morphed images have high quality. I mean, less uh, ghosting artifacts compared to the other data sets. Okay. Um, any more questions? If, if this is not the case, I would like to thank you a lot, Puria and uh, other uh, uh, presenters. And uh, we take a short break. We are a little bit over time. So let's meet in five minutes, that 20 after the hour, uh, where we will have our second keynotes from Luisa Vertoliva and uh, also three presentations, paper presentations. So thank you very much and see you all in, in, in five minutes.
Hi, Hiran. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Uh, I cannot hear you. Uh, you're muted. Oh, sorry. sorry. Okay. Nice to meet you. Um, okay. Shall I try to share the presentation? Yeah. I was about to ask Luisa. you. Luisa. Hi, Hi, well. Hi. Hi. Happy New Year. What, I, time, what time is it now? It's uh, 10 20, almost 10 20 oh. evening. Oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I watched your presentation, congrats. <laughs> it was very oh, nice. Thanks, Louise. Thank very you. clear. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to share the, the slides just to check if that everything is going. Uh... Okay, let me. Perfect. Is it fine? Okay. It's fine. Perfect. <laughs> okay. So when uh, when you think it's uh, the case, you can just uh, yeah. Okay. I think we have uh, we are on time. Maybe we can just give uh, one minute more. Maybe and then we start. Okay. Okay. Perfect. I think we can start now. Luisa, if you're ready. Yes. Yeah. Um, welcome, everyone, to the second session of uh, the workshop. I'm very glad to introduce you, uh, Luisa Vadoliva from um, University Federico II, uh, or Federico II of Naples, Italy. Um, I was told that uh, Luisa is also called as Annalisa. If you <laughs> see the name interchange, uh, do not be confused. Um, <laughs> Uh, Luisa Vadoliva is uh, lead, she has been a visiting professor since 2018 in Friedrich Alexander University, and in 2019 to 2020 she has been visiting scientist at Google AI in San Francisco. Her scientific her scientific interests are in the field of image and video processing, uh, with main contributions in the area of multimedia forensics. She has published more than 120 academic publications, including 45 journals. And she is the PI of University Federico II of Naples in the Discover Project, uh, which stands for a data driven integrated approach for semantic inconsistencies verification. It's funded by DARPA under the Semaphore program from 2020 to 2024. And she has been actively contributing, she has been actively contributing to the academic community through service as a technical chair of the 2019 IEEE workshop for uh, information, forensics and security, and 2021 ACM workshop for uh, on information hiding and multimedia security, area chair at ICIP since 27. She has also been co-chair of IEEE CBPR media forensics uh, workshop, both in 2020 and 2021. She is also on the editorial board of IEEE transactions on information forensics, and security and IEEE signal processing letters and has been a guest editor for IEEE Journal of uh, Selected Topics in Signal Processing. Um, Luisa Vardilova is also the chair of IEEE Transactions for Information Transactions for Information Forensics and Security Technical Committee and vice chair of Euraset Signal for Signal and Data Analytics for Machine Learning. She is also the recipient of 2018 Google Faculty Award for Machine Perception and the TUMIS Hans Fischer Senior Fellowship between 2020 and 2023. She has been elected to the grade of IEEE Fellow since January 2021. Um, that being said, um, for those of you who do not know Luisa Vadilova very well, uh, you might remember from uh, Face Forensics Dataset. <laughs> 
I will not kill the surprise. The floor is all yours, uh, Louisa. Thank you, Kiran. Really many thanks for your presentation. And I'm very glad to be here and to give this talk. Uh, the talk is about deepfake detection. And uh, I will present uh, actually the state of the art and some of the major challenges in the field. OK, so this is actually uh, a very short tour on deepfake detection. Uh, first, we will uh, start uh, about uh, the reasons for which we can detect deepfakes, then uh, uh, just uh, trying to give an idea of which are the ideas that uh, have been proposed in the field, the major challenges, and also consider an adversarial scenario. Uh, Val already talked about this uh, cat and mouse game, and uh, I will show to you an, an example uh, on, also in this, uh, in this context. So first of all, why is detection possible? Uh, for sure, you have seen already a lot of uh, synthetic generated images and videos, uh, and sometimes they present visual artifacts. This can give uh, you the, uh, the idea that maybe you can detect them visually. Sometimes you have these uh, color anomalies uh, on the ears here or on the nose uh, in this other image. And, um, um, or, for example, there can be some semantic inconsistencies like uh, the lack of uh, symmetry, like different eye colors, uh, different earrings, not, uh, not perfect symmetry, especially in faces. Of course, I mean, this is improving really a lot. And so if you look at the very recent uh, gun-generated uh, architectures, uh, they do not have this type of uh, uh, artifacts anymore. It is actually not easy in any case to preserve all the specific um, characteristics of a subject. So whenever you actually consider a deep fake where you have a source identity and then uh, you actually replace the face of another subject, so we, you have this target video and replace the face with the source identity, it is in any case difficult to perfectly preserve what, the, what are, for example, the face expressions, the, the way a person is moving the head or is conveying the emotions. So it's not really easy to perfectly um, um, preserve all this identity related traces, this sort of soft biometrics that can be exploited in order to detect, for example, a deep fake. And in this case, it's really much more difficult than the visual artifacts you have seen before. But there are also hidden artifacts. So uh, you can see in the literature uh, some papers that try to exploit artifacts that are present inside the images but are not visible and uh, that are typically um, caused, for example, by the specific GAN architecture that, uh, um, that has some uh, specific um, type of processing that causes some uh, artifacts. For example, you have these frequency domain traces, these peaks in the Fourier transform that are related to do a sampling operation that is typical of the GAN architecture. But you can also uh, extract this sort of artificial fingerprints from a GAN image. And uh, there are some works that actually try to do this and uh, try to extract a sort of fingerprint that uh, can be related to a specific architecture. This, uh, uh, I'm showing this to you here, where a fingerprint of two different architectures have been estimated over a certain number of residual image. A residual image is the image where the content has been suppressed. And you can see that uh, by averaging this uh, residual uh, over this residuals over a large number of images, then uh, you, the image converts to a quasi periodical, uh, a quasi stable uh, periodical pattern, where uh, actually it, and then it is uh, uh, very specific of a GAN architecture. For example, here you can see that if we evaluate the correlation between these two fingerprints extracted from two different architectures, they can be perfectly, not, okay, almost perfectly separated. And uh, what is interesting is that you can even extract a fingerprint based on the specific data set the GAN architecture was trained on. So there are, there are a lot of works that try to 
um, uh, to show the, the presence of this unique fingerprint. Now, the point is that also real images can be, uh, can be actually characterized by some specific uh, fingerprints, some specific artifacts, because each camera has a sort of uh, pipeline, an internal pipeline with a lot of processing operations. And whenever you disrupt uh, a, the pattern of an image, you're actually modifying the pattern of the camera. And you can see as manipulation as a sort of anomalies. So if you're able to extract this sort of camera fingerprint, then you can, uh, you can uh, highlight the possible, the, the, the highlight anomalies inside this uh, fingerprint and detect this uh, manipulation. So, I mean, you can actually visualize or more understand the possible uh, manipulation, possible traces in, uh, in a generated image or in a deep, or a deep fake video. But there are also a lot of traces that are hidden and can be properly highlighted. So let's go now to look at the major deep learning strategies that have been proposed so far. So most of them are based on a supervised learning uh, approach. So typically they rely on large data sets of pristine and fake videos, and then try to learn what is real, what is fake. Of course, uh, we don't perfectly know which type of artifacts they are relying on, especially if you use uh, uh, the architecture as a sort of black box. But of course, I mean, there are uh, visual or hidden artifacts on which this type of, uh, you know, on which deep learning can actually uh, learn. And there are a lot of um, methods that have been proposed so far. Typically, they, um, so they, they try to, um, device a specific architecture in, uh, for, for this forensic uh, analysis. But uh, like this Mesonet, Capsule Forensics, Concurrence Net, where they try to extract uh, some specific patterns from the image or the video. But often even pre-trained deep networks on ImageNet can work really well. And uh, uh, often a very good choice is to uh, get rid of the content of the image uh, because uh, all the artifacts are often uh, uh, present in the high frequency uh, pattern of the image. And uh, this also motivates the fact that uh, some of the solutions are based on uh, frequency analysis, especially on high frequency analysis. Of course, for videos, uh, recurrent networks, spatial temporal features uh, are also used, um, also attention mechanisms, and recently even uh, transformers. So there are really a very large uh, variety of uh, methods, uh, of learning-based methods. And there are also methods that try to detect some specific uh, traces uh, in order also to be much more explainable. As also Val said before, it's important to understand what we are detecting. So for example, if uh, we can uh, understand uh, why this is a deep fake or not uh, because of eye blinking or some corner specular highlights uh, or even the head pause inconsistencies, uh, um, now, all these type of artifacts, uh, unfortunately, they are disappearing. So uh, some of these type of approaches were very, are very good on some old data sets, but cannot be applied uh, successfully on more recent ones. And uh, okay, as uh, already Kiran said, uh, I was involved in the, in the development of Face Forensics Plus Plus. So this was one of the first data set. Of course, if we want, if we want to apply deep learning based methods, we really need large data sets of uh, uh, pristine and manipulated videos. In this case, uh, we have uh, four different type of uh, manipulations. So both uh, face whopping and, uh, um, but also facial enactment. So, uh, changing the identity of the person or changing only the expression of the face. And this was interesting because one could actually perform some interesting analysis uh, in terms of uh, uh, which type of approaches could work well or not on some specific type of manipulations. And uh, then the data, the face forensics was also uh, was increased thanks to Google uh, using uh, that uh, actually created the 
over 3,000 3, manipulated videos uh, with um, uh, 28 paid actors. In this case, it was much more, there was much more variety of scenes. It was only face whooping, uh, but people were also moving. Uh, there were indoor, outdoor. So, I mean, in terms of uh, type of data, it was, uh, uh, it was, it varied a lot. So it was uh, also very interesting. And uh, typically the pipeline for supervised detection uh, extracts the face uh, in a video and uh, then classify only the face. Of course, if you already know that uh, only the face was uh, maybe modified and the background was actually not informative, uh, most of the detectors uh, actually detect only the face. Uh, of course, then uh, you can say how, how large should be the box and uh, there are a lot of possible solutions you can use, like, for example, if including the border of the face, which can be helpful because, of course, you have uh, typical, they are manipulated in order to uh, make the face much more realistic and, uh, and uh, perform blending uh, on the border. Or maybe if you want to uh, in, um, also consider some, uh, some analysis of the background and the internal of the face, then you should consider a much larger box. Okay, there are a lot of possible uh, strategies that you can apply. In terms of detection results, uh, what was uh, interesting in our analysis that we did uh, a couple of years ago was that uh, actually um, all the methods, all the deep learning methods, uh, whenever you have data for training and for training that were also present in test, actually there was no real difference between uh, a very deep network or a machine learning one using, like in this case, steg analysis features that were quite common in forensics and that worked very well. What really was a problem was when you worked on compressed data. And in particular, we considered the two types of quality, the high quality and the low quality videos. And you can see that here that now, the difference is uh, much more uh, strong. So you can see that the, a deep network like exception can uh, really give better results than, uh, than shallow networks and uh, than any crafted features. So actually compression is one of the major issue in, um, in the, for video deep fakes, uh, also because compression is quite strong for videos and it can be really a challenge. Uh, of course, you reduce the content uh, of the data, you reduce the precision, and uh, maybe since these traces are really very uh, small and, and you can, sometimes they are not visible. So if you compress the data, it can be much more challenging even to detect them. And also for localization, uh, in this case, we have two phases and uh, almost the same on data that are at high, the highest quality, the detection is perfect, while on compressed data, you can see that uh, some false alarms arise. So compression is for sure one of uh, a, a major problem for deep fake detection. This is an example on YouTube where uh, in order to make the network work properly, we had to fine tune on some uh, YouTube videos. And this was important because the pipeline of compression of YouTube, of YouTube is quite different from what we, we find, for example, from videos coming from our camera or our smartphones. And so we needed to fine tune on videos coming from the web in order to have a good the detection, like in this case. And uh, this is uh, another problem uh, that also Vail uh, mentioned before of, uh, of data that actually are not exactly the same. And so you can not really um, have a tool that was trained on your data and then try it on data that are a bit different. And even the compression pipeline or the way data were resized or the, the, the resolution of the data can impact the final result. This is indeed a result on a deep fake that was created by the MIT Center for Advanced Virtuality. It is interesting because it presents uh, President Nixon, Nixon that was delivering a speech uh, where actually the Apollo 11 crew were, were unable to return from the moon. 
And uh, so the, the speech was completely changed. And uh, we made this uh, um, visualization use, uh, using the class activation maps. And of course, as also uh, you already say this morning, I mean, this, this is not something for which you can really explain or interpret the deep network, but at least it was helpful because it pointed perfectly on the mouth because only the speech was modified. So only the, what the President Nixon said. And so this was interesting in order to uh, check if the deep network that uh, we were, uh, we tested in this case was pointing to the right area in the face. So of course it's not solving the problem, but at least it can give some hints. And now, okay, in the last year, in the last two years, uh, there are really a growing uh, expansion of uh, deep fake data sets, which is great because we can test uh, in different conditions our solutions. And here, there are, this is just uh, some examples like um, CelebDF, the very large data set from Facebook, uh, Deeper Forensics, Wild Deep Fake. So there are really a lot of data sets and we can uh, really test now the, 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 the algorithm. So for example, CelebDF is a, a realistic data set. Also in this case, it's only, only face working, but it's, uh, uh, there is a, a great care in order to produce a realistic videos. While Facebook has the advantage to be very, very large, very different conditions, a lot of different people, different races, and uh, even the, the type of uh, scenario is quite a different. Uh, the resolution of the face is very different. So it's really in the wild. And it can be very useful uh, for training, but even for test. Uh, you can see here that uh, the large variety of manipulations that is present in the Facebook data set. Uh, here um, in the, the uh, vertical axis, we have the face recognition distance. Uh, and in the horizontal axis, the rate of different pixels. So really the number of uh, uh, manipulations that has been uh, carried out on the faces can be really much, very much variable uh, on, in this data set. And so this can be uh, maybe helpful for testing uh, uh, in the wild. And so what we have done, we, have, we conducted a generalization analysis of uh, our, uh, our solution in order to understand the generalization ability. And uh, okay, you can see that uh, if you train on the same data set, like, like on Face Forensics or on the Facebook data set, so training and test are aligned, then the performance can be uh, largely over 90%. But uh, if you exactly do the a cross data set analysis, then performance drops. I mean, this is actually well known in the computer vision community. Uh, and uh, in particular for this, uh, for um, uh, in, in forensics, uh, this is a major problem because uh, these forensic traces uh, are really very easy to, to remove and can be different from a, in, in this case, for example, the face forensics data set and the other and the, the Facebook data set have for sure even a different type of uh, pipeline in terms of uh, compression and resolution and even of type of manipulation. And so even if we take the same face forensics data set and we train on a manipulation and test on another, in this case, uh, these are to very different manipulation because face whooping is different from partial reenactment, which was implemented in face to face. In this case, even we have like 50%, uh, like uh, uh, really, uh, we are, it's a random answer, a random uh, in, in terms of detection. It, it really that it is, it is really not uh, informative. And of course, if you um, don't know uh, the test data, of course, this can be a problem in the sense that uh, you know uh, your deep learning model, how it was trained on, the, but you don't know what is uh, in the wild, what is, uh, what is in the, your test data. And so it's a problem to, um, to trust <laughs> your detector. And uh, what you can say is, okay, I trained my detector in, on these manipulations, on this type of data, so I can trust uh, the, uh, the, the, the results only on similar type of uh, manipulations and data, which is uh, quite important. Otherwise you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, 
you, you don't know what you're doing actually. So these are some other results on generalization, even on fully synthetic generated images like cycle GAN and style GAN, which are uh, GAN generated images. Also in this case, uh, you can see this uh, mismatch where if you train on the same uh, architecture, you have almost perfect uh, result. Otherwise, uh, it's uh, also in this case, it's completely, I mean, everything is actually random. Okay, so in the supervised setting, I mean, it's, it's perfect when you know that the type of manipulations and data are very similar to the test data. Otherwise, uh, actually it's not a good solution and you need something that is more general and that is even more robust to possible mismatch. And so uh, the, the point is how to gain generalization, how to improve uh, your, the approach uh, in order to make it work, uh, even in conditions that did not really fit what you have in training. So there are different uh, uh, solutions in the literature. One possibility is to use the one class learning. So you actually train all your real data and then uh, whatever is, uh, um, is uh, actually seen as an anomaly with respect to real data, then it is uh, uh, considered a manipulation. So what you are um, actually trying to uh, model are real data and you do not consider fake data. So you do not consider um, fake data or deep fakes inside your training, but you only uh, consider real data which can be something uh, interesting because uh, you cannot be polarized to the type of deep fakes. Other possibility are a few shot learning or even incremental learning. As also I said, continual learning is important and maybe it can be a very, uh, the, the solution in the future in the, in the sense that uh, you should always retrain and adapt your solution to new, new scenarios. Uh, and also another interesting possibility is to look at common traces in fake faces. So what uh, uh, typically all the um, pipeline of deep fake uh, video generation do is to create this blending on the border of the face. So one point was, okay, why do not detect these blending artifacts, which are common to all the deep fakes? And the other type of uh, uh, interesting uh, um, uh, solutions are augmentation ensemble, which are actually gives uh, a very uh, interesting improvement. And then this identity-based methods. Also in this case, you model what is real, what are the real identities. And whenever you find some mismatch, you are considering that, that the, it, there was a manipulation, probably. Okay, so let's uh, go to through some of these uh, approaches. And uh, let's start with this one class learning. For one class learning, what we have done was to actually consider only real images, uh, many real images coming from different cameras and then train a SIMIS network. And uh, in this SIMIS network was, uh, was trained so as to minimize the distance between patches coming from same camera and even same position and maximize uh, the ones from different cameras. And actually we worked on residual patches. So we removed uh, also in this case, the content of the scene. And uh, using this procedure, we wanted to extract uh, what uh, were actually the, um, the, the camera fingerprint, a sort of camera fingerprint that we called noise print. Um, what was interesting of this approach is that uh, you didn't need any prior information on the device and uh, uh, it focused on all the possible camera model artifacts like the mosaicing, JPEG artifacts, whatever is inside the camera. And uh, this, uh, this procedure that uh, doesn't need to have the camera under test also in training, was able to extract this sort of noise residual. And this noise residual could enhance traces coming from different cameras, but even editing based anomalies. So here you can see the heat map where we cluster the, the, this type of 
pattern so that we can highlight the anomaly inside the camera. So th this was uh, actually interesting because uh, um, I want to repeat this, it's trained only on real data. And here are some sample results. Uh, you can see here in this, in this second image, uh, all the this, uh, uh, periodic patterns which are related to the JPEG uh, pattern. And um, um, this is also can be interesting because uh, you can see here that there is a JPEG grid misalignment between the spliced uh, subject in this image that can be highlighted extracting this pattern. Uh, again, these are very, very uh, subtle traces, so it's not easy to extract them correctly, especially if the image is uh, very much compressed. And of course, in this case, uh, if you notice this misalignment, you are actually highlighting the border of the two areas. So it's a quite different type of analysis in this case. And we actually extended this also to videos. So we took a lot of videos from different cameras, different smartphones, and tried to extract this fingerprint from the camera. And here you can see the a deep fake with the noise print that was averaged over, uh, I think it was like 15, 20 frames in the video. And then we extracted the heat map. And we made this analysis on the, the different manipulations of deep fakes, face to face, and face walk. But you can see that this, uh, I mean, the background is quite noisy. It's much more noisy than what we can find in an image. And this is related to the fact that in a video, the compression uh, operation is much more complex. And even is, uh, mm, mm, I mean, it is much more complicated because of the, of the movement of the of the person of the uh, of the of the video, and uh, so there are a lot of uh, artifacts. If we if we only focus on the face, then we actually remove all these uh, variations, and then we can highlight the manipulations. And this is an example on YouTube, where uh, the the actor, the actor of the movie was actually modified. And you can see on the face of the actor that, uh, that is actually a deep fake, uh, all this uh, um, uh, black area that is moving and that is uh, showing that there is something weird that was uh, actually uh, uh, done on, on this uh, camera video fingerprints. And here it's, you can find actually the, the, the heat maps where there is, a, there is a sort of mask that was actually added on the, on the face. Now, this type of analysis is, uh, uh, we found it a bit complex in the sense that the number of videos that we were able to, uh, to, um, to uh, extract and uh, from re real videos was not sufficient in our opinion in order to have a tool that was uh, robust to a very strong compression. So, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, when we did this work a couple of years ago, we didn't have a very large data set of real videos, uh, but uh, now, I mean, we are retraining it because uh, actually we can uh, rely on much more data. Okay, and then augmentation and sampling, even if these are like some standard and basic operations, I mean, they are very quite, very effective. So I want just to, give, to tell you some words about that. So uh, augmentation, I mean, now everybody does augmentation because uh, of course uh, it's important to, 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 uh, to, to make some uh, uh, geometric operations in a deep learning uh, uh, framework like rotation, resizing, flipping. But in forensics, uh, it's quite important to consider some further processing operations, like for example, compression, blurring, noise in injection. And this helps a lot to gain generalization. Even ensembling, uh, so fusing different networks can help a lot. Uh, and this was a strategy that was carried out uh, by the winner of the challenge uh, organized by Facebook. And I will show to you a few examples um, uh, right now. I mean, we, let's start first with images and then we move to videos. So for images, 
an interesting experiment that was carried out in 2020, this CVPR paper, was actually to train only using one single GAN architecture, progressive growing GAN, but using many different categories, 20 different models, and a strong augmentation. I mean, the augmentation was actually only compression and blurring, but, but it was actually sufficient to uh, have a very good generalization ability towards different type of architecture. So not the, um, this is the area under the curve, the network was trained only on progressive growing gun. And so of course on progressive growing gun, the detection is perfect, but it was also tested on other gun architectures. And you can see that the results are very good. Um, if we actually uh, compress images, and you can see that, uh, for example, these peaks that uh, characterize the GAN images uh, tend to disappear with compression. So if we compress images, I mean, we have, of course, a performance uh, gets a bit worse, not for the GAN architecture that was present in training, however, but in general, the results are quite high. I mean, higher than 80%. Now, note that this is the area under the curve. If uh, I show to you the accuracy, the accuracy is completely different in terms of, uh, I mean, if you see here, the the, the, the results are very good, but here, I mean, it's, they are really very low. And the point is that what is really very important is this threshold. So the point is that, that when you evaluate the area under the curve, you don't have to fix a threshold, but you have to fix a threshold in a practical scenario and when you want to evaluate accuracy. So the point is that Theoretically, you can distinguish uh, uh, real images from uh, a progressive growing gun or from cycle gun. The problem is that the threshold is different. And the point is that you don't know the threshold because you don't know what you have in test. So what is uh, really important is not only to show um, the area under the curve, but also to show this uh, accuracy and to highlighted the importance to fix this threshold in the correct way. So it's important to, in the generalization, to have a good uh, accuracy. In the practical case, many cases, you have to decide uh, what is real, what is fake. And what do we uh, tested as a best performing solutions in, uh, for gun detection is actually to uh, avoid uh, resizing. So um, avoid to modify the data in uh, like, for, I mean, resizing is an operation that is typically carried out by all the deep learning solutions in computer vision, but it can destroy very important traces uh, in forensic applications. So we noted that uh, uh, resizing was not actually something to, uh, to, to do for gun detection. And uh, um, even um, a, a very simple modification that was uh, considering uh, node unsampling at the first layer of the network also helped a lot because at the beginning we actually um, wanted to um, preserve um, the most important information from the image in order to lose as uh, much as to, 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 to avoid losing important information for the discrimination. And this should also be during tests. So during tests, you should not resize the image, but use a patch wise analysis and then uh, consider the um, and then put together all the detection from each patch. And for videos, uh, here I, I, I show to you uh, some examples on partial manipulations where we actually consider the proposed the, the solution of the winner of the Cabo goal competition. Uh, interesting, this, this solution was not actually a temporal based solution. It, it was, uh, it extracted the 32 frames from the video and averaged them and performed strong augmentation and ensembling. And uh, um, an interesting thing that was carried out was uh, this face cutout. So uh, it was not a, a standard cutout, but uh, cutout was uh, tailored for the specific part of the face, like for example, dilating the eyes or the noise, mouth. Uh, this, uh, um, so this was one of the solution implemented by the winner. So here we uh, show an, an experiment where we considered 
First, a single frame analysis. Uh, the FDC is the Facebook dataset, uh, and the training is carried out uh, also on the Facebook dataset. And then we perform the experiment also on the Google dataset, which is DFT and CelebDFT. You can see that on this single frame, uh, I mean, performance are quite similar. Then if we uh, perform augmentation, uh, performance increases. And uh, uh, cutout, I mean, cutout for the Facebook dataset was uh, actually a good uh, solution in the, in the sense that it actually give uh, a good performance even for CelebDF, but not on the Google dataset. When then we move to a video level analysis, so we average the, uh, the performance over 20, 32 frames, we have, a, again, of course, a, an improvement. And what is really a big improvement was given by the ensemble of different networks. In terms of uh, uh, actually of generalization, this was actually something that you can receive uh, uh, with the, a um, small effort uh, in a certain sense, but uh, it actually helps a lot. So augmentation and uh, ensembling of different networks was uh, uh, really important uh, in terms of uh, gaining generalization. Okay, so this actually, okay, these are these considerations is what I have already said. So working, of course, on multiple frames, uh, um, augmentation, ad hoc augmentation, so especially compression, uh, blurring, noise injection, this partial cutout, and then the ensembling of different networks uh, helps a lot. And efficient net was actually a solution that uh, worked best uh, for deep fake detection. Okay, so let's go now for to this uh, identity-based methods. Uh, these are quite, uh, uh, there was a, a quite uh, um, large work by the um, research group uh, led by Hani Farid in uh, 2010. Uh, in 19 and 2020, where they started to work with the face expression, head movements, uh, the behavior of uh, uh, a person, even phone and reason mismatch. Um, that, that is also very interesting. So we also worked on this uh, identity-based approach where the idea was to uh, characterize uh, a real subject and then evaluate the distance uh, with respect to the test video. So the, hypothesis, the, hypo, the hypothesis is that you uh, have a reference set of videos of real faces of a specific actor, uh, which uh, can, I mean, uh, you, don't, you, you need at least like five, six, even maximum 10 videos of uh, a real subject. This is the hypothesis that you are doing. And then you evaluate a, a distance computation with respect to the video under test. And uh, uh, first, uh, first of all, we actually carried out uh, in, an experiment on the Google dataset uh, um, last year where we performed face recognition. So we actually used a face recognition deep learning based method uh, that was available uh, in the, the literature. And we tried to do nothing else than face recognition, and we were able to discriminate the videos very well. So the point was that uh, deep fix, uh, as you can see here, it, it, if, you, if, you, if you look at the target subject and the fake video, of course, I mean, they resemble different identities. So if you do face recognition, very likely you will be able to recognize them. The problem is that uh, you don't only have face warping for deep fakes, but often you have this facial reenactment where the identity is not changed, but you only modify the expression. And these are really much more difficult to detect, uh, at least in our experience. Um, and I mean, you don't, in the literature, there are not a lot of data sets about facial reenactment. So probably the, the most of the literature was focused on deep fix, but uh, I think this is uh, really important to work on because, uh, I mean, the identity is the same, you just modified the face expression. So we wanted particularly to focus to, on to this type of manipulations. 
And our solution is, uh, so a video under test, as I told you before, a reference videos. And then uh, we have uh, um, a solution that was based on 3DMM uh, um, features that are 3D morphable features. And then we have this temporal ID net, and then we evaluate the distance. Uh, this paper was presented uh, at last ICCV uh, last year. And um, okay, so the idea is actually to, for each face, uh, we extract features uh, that are related to shape, expression, pose uh, using this 3D morphable model. And the network is also trained uh, so that the, actually what happens is that the embedded vectors of the same face are close, but are far from those of different subjects. So we have this contrastive learning strategy. And uh, um, we, we also use a generative network. So this, the generative network has the goal to, ge to um, generate features that are um, coherent to the identity of the individual, but uh, with the expression of another. So they try to simulate uh, what is inside a deep fake uh, with fascia reenactment. And uh, this adversarial game actually helped us a lot to improve on uh, the, this uh, type of manipulations that we can found in fascia reenactment. So we have actually this uh, 3D MM generative network, and then we have uh, the temporal D network because we wanted to exploit the movement uh, or in of the of a subject in a video, and uh, we also wanted to um, e include this game in order to increase the discrimination ability of the network, especially for fascia reenactment. And uh, here this, uh, there is also an embedded space visualization that helped us to understand that uh, in this embedded space, the real videos relative to different actors were separated. So here we have uh, blue is perfectly separated by, by red, so these two subjects, but also we can separate the manipulated videos of uh, the same actor. So we have both face whooping and fascial enactment that are separated from the real videos. And these are some examples also here. So in the embedded space, the features are separated from two different actors, but even with manipulations of the same actor. And what was interesting was that, so we trained on a box celeb to data set where we don't have actually the uh, information about the video that are under test. So it's completely unpolarized. So every time we don't want to, um, to consider training and test that are similar, we all, always want to be completely separated from the test. In this case, uh, Box Celeb 2 dataset contains about 5,000 real identities. So we don't see deep fakes and we do not see in training the uh, subject that is under test. And then we compared with the learning based methods, traditional supervised methods that were all trained on the Facebook datasets in order to have like a fair comparison even in, among this type of datasets. And, um, and we uh, tested on high quality and low quality videos. We considered as comparison some state of the art, some ensemble methods, temporal based methods and identity based methods. So we also compared with the work by Hani Farid that includes a face recognition network. So it's more suited for deep fakes, uh, for face looping. Okay, so now you can see here the results. So if you have manipulation in training, uh, uh, not that Sefer, Seferbekov is the winner of the deep fake detection challenge. And uh, so if we have manipulation in training, uh, okay, you have very good results here you have manipulation out of training. So you train on a data set and test on another data set. And in particular here, we have deep fakes against fascia reenactment. You can see that for um, the work that are based on identity, you actually have good results, even uh, if you don't uh, have seen those deep fakes, because I mean, they are, it's a completely different paradigm. And for unseen compression, so if we work on data on different compressions to what was uh, seen in training, again, you have uh, a 
you, you actually have uh, a solution for which uh, the, the, the supervised approaches uh, are not able to handle this uh, difference, while for the, the deep fake, for the identity based, in particular, our solution instead was able to obtain good results. We also made uh, um, actually a, an experiment in the wild where we wanted to uh, understand what happened uh, using uh, a lot of videos of Nicolas Cage that turns out to be one of the most deep faked uh, with Tom Cruise <laughs> actor in the wild. And uh, so we consider here, we have three real videos and we already evaluated the distance with respect to a reference video that uh, we uh, that was available and uh, uh, you can see here that for all these surreal videos the distance is low for the deep fakes videos the distance was very high and then we made also um, we consider also these other two videos uh, which is uh, an imitator and a deep fake of the of the imitator and here you can see that the the, the situation is much more challenging because when you have an imitator then of course it resembles much more the, the actor and the, the problem is more difficult. In this case, still above the threshold, but of course this is a much more difficult situation. And okay, so last example I want to show you is an adversarial scenario where uh, we are considering actually some uh, adversarial tax. Now, of course, uh, there, there are a lot of literature now on adversarial perturbations in general in computer vision and in particular to deepfakes also. There is also uh, approaches that uh, remove the gun fingerprints, uh, that uh, anonymize the device. And in our case, uh, what I will show to you, it's uh, uh, inserting camera fingerprints into gun images. So we have uh, Okay, so let's skip this adversarial perturbation. There is a lot of literature on this where you can add the noise and modify the response of uh, the network. But what we have done uh, recently was to take a synthetic image and uh, um, actually make it appear like acquired by a real camera, which means uh, insert uh, in the synthetic image a camera fingerprint, the camera fingerprint that I've shown to you before, and that characterized real images. So what uh, can we actually attack a gun detector? And the assumptions are that, that uh, the synthetic images uh, should actually appear as it was taken by a specific real camera. Of course, it should not uh, introduce some visible distortions. And uh, we do not have some uh, specific knowledge about the gun detector, but uh, we suppose that the training images are drawn from the same distribution. And the approach is actually uh, how to, so how to insert this uh, uh, gun, uh, this camera fingerprint. So we have a generator where we introduce the traces of a specific ca camera, and we try to preserve, of course, the semantic uh, content. Then we have a discriminator, and in this case, the discriminators should distinguish real images from generated images, but also from synthetic images. And finally, we have an embedder, and the embedder is actually uh, was trained using uh, many different camera models, and uh, the embedder tries uh, actually to um, to uh, extract a discriminative feature vector of the camera model. So the generator has a second goal, which is to fool the embedder. And so to ensure that the feature vectors that are extracted from the attacked images are indistinguishable from those of the real images. Okay, so in, uh, this is actually our approach and we uh, trained uh, the um, using, uh, training was uh, considering 40 images of the target camera. And we used a collection of different gun architectures. For the embedder, we trained on 60 camera models and we tested both on images present in training, but also on images, on gun images that were out of training. These are an example of original and attacked images, just to show that there is no visual, visual distortion of the, of the faces. 
And so, okay, so we consider this uh, approach that was proposed uh, in 2019, um, where the true positive rate is very high. So for or before the attack for all the GAN architectures, it's lower for the distribution for the GAN architecture out of training. But after the attack, uh, we can actually reduce uh, actually the true positive rate uh, and uh, make it almost uh, actually mm, uh, almost to less than 10%, actually. So it's uh, really very low for almost all the GAN architectures. The same is also for the proposed uh, paper of, of uh, proposed in SCVPR, where actually it was uh, also in this case, the performance are really very good. And uh, I mean, this approach that was um, uh, where there was a lot of augmentation, as I told you before, this was actually better in terms of, of, uh, um, of uh, behavior with respect to the attack, but in any case, it reduces a lot, especially on out of training architectures. So actually, uh, so, Let's go to the conclusion. So the technology is really advancing very fast and uh, new and more realistic deepfakes are generated. So it's not easy to develop reliable forensic detectors. It's hard um, because you the, the, in, in order to have a good detector, you should consider non possible non-malicious post-processing like compression, but even resizing. It should generalize to unseen attacks, and it should also uh, consider the presence of a skilled, of a malicious attacker who knows the principles on which the detector is working and so tries to attack it. So it's uh, actually this, uh, this game where we have to defend from an attacker. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, future direction, so I think that uh, we really need the two uh, solutions that are possible, that are robust to possible adversarial attacks, not only to uh, attacks that are generic, like the ones that, uh, as I told you before, the uh, considering the, the adversarial noise that is uh, so, um, uh, that is uh, studied a lot in the computer vision, but even attacks that are tailored to some specific detectors, like in this case where you are adding uh, the camera fingerprint of the of the, a real image. Another important thing is to characterize the malicious intent in the detection process. I mean, not uh, whatever we modify or is uh, actually uh, is something that is malicious and, and should be that one should actually distinguish what is. Uh, a deep fake because with respect to what is actually like an enhancement using a deep learning based analysis. And this is something that uh, uh, it's very important uh, in the sense that uh, in the future, probably everything will be synthetic and most of the synthetic stuff we will find over the internet, maybe it's not malicious. So it's important to characterize it in terms of uh, uh, malicious or not. As also Val said, we need interpretable solutions. This is something that has not been explored yet. And um, as, as also he said, it's not that just that a class activation map is a good solution. We should really go to semantic, to trying to understand what's happening. So the identity-based approaches and uh, in somehow some uh, the, the, this one class learning tries uh, to uh, explain better, but of course, we need some more sophistication uh, in the solutions developed. Um, now there is also much more work on video plus audio, on image and text, so considering a multimodal analysis. And this is also something that is important. I mean, in my opinion, the, the the, the, the literature on this uh, on multimodal analysis is a bit limited because the data sets, uh, we don't have uh, realistic data sets, large realistic data sets available right now, at least there are uh, very small attempts to do this. And then there is another completely different directions, which is active methods. So trying to uh, protect your data. So not only detect uh, that there was a manipulations, but maybe insert some uh, signature inside the data in order to protect the data. And so uh, uh, considering a completely different perspective that probably 
could be uh, an, it an interesting solution in, uh, in the future. And there is a lot of effort in this direction. Okay, I, I finished my presentation and I'm available for possible questions. <laughs> Thank you, Luisa. Thank you for taking us uh, to a wonderful uh, talk through through the entire history of uh, deepfakes. Um, it was very in informative. Thank um, you. Let's see. Uh, I, I'm just trying to see if there are any questions from the audience. Ah, so Nazar has a question. Uh, hi, Luisa. Uh, thank hi. you very much for the very informative talk. Uh, I have a question. You talked about the difference between reenactment and uh, what we call deep fakes, and, and uh, that we might be more vulnerable to reenactments. Um, there are increasing number of works that deal with audio to video uh, generation, where the image right. is right. audio and one or more images of a certain yeah. identity. Where do you see this? Uh, is it a different problem? Is it a challenging thing? No, yes, I mean, it's what you said. I mean, so you, you have like an audio and then you change the, actually the speech of a person and actually you're not changing the, it's the identity. And uh, yes, I believe this is much more challenging in terms of uh, detection because uh, of course, I mean, the, the person is there, you are not changing uh, the identity of the person, you're changing the way it, the, the person is, uh, of course, talking and even the speech, maybe in this case, audio will be uh, very important in the, in the analysis. So you need to enlarge and consider this multimodal analysis, which is something we are doing, but it's not easy to create this new, I mean, there are a lot of, yeah. of, of work and of GitHub in terms of generation, but there are not already large data sets that you can rely on. Uh, I think I've seen just one, I mean, right now, I mean, realistic, where you can uh, uh, really consider it as a realistic data set, because sometimes data sets, I mean, even face forensics, uh, many videos, uh, there are uh, some artifacts uh, and uh, you can spot them visually. Of course, in general, you, you want a solution that can spot uh, videos at scale, which is not easy, of course. I mean, like considering something at scale over the web, because uh, sometimes they are also much more, uh, they are computation intensive in terms of um, solution because it's a video. So you have to uh, work uh, uh, on uh, several frames, extract frames. I mean, it, it, it's, not, uh, it's not easy, but in general, um, Yes, I think that this can be more challenging, or at least if, even if it is not more challenging, you need to extend the approach, uh, including audio. And so, uh, I mean, maybe there are some methods that already were presented about inconsistencies, about the, the way you are talking and uh, the, the, I mean, the way you are moving the, 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 the mouth and lips. Uh, you know, lip synchronization. But the point is that I think that even lip synchronization is something that uh, will be done uh, almost perfectly in the future. So that's not really easy. So maybe uh, all this identity stuff about the voice and the, 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 the way a person is uh, talking, uh, maybe it can be of interest. I mean, there is, there is really a lot of things to do. Yeah. Just generation of the data <laughs> it would be... <laughs> Something uh, yes, you're right. I mean, there are a lot of things that, uh, in terms of generation, there are really a lot of advancements, and this creates new opportunities for detection and for uh, the analysis, uh, looking at more type of uh, artifacts. Yeah, and and I don't know if you agree with me, but I see that uh, being the bad guys in research, so to create better attacks uh, is is very important for. To force yes, attacks. Yes, but note that there are a lot. I mean, I didn't talk about all the good uh, applications of deep fakes, yeah. uh, but yeah. there are, of course, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, video, um, the, the, all the cinema production, movies production, uh, and uh, the, the, there are a lot of positive uh, applications, which are typically the main focus of uh, this, uh, let's say, deep fakes. I mean, all the computer graphics uh, has always uh, done, uh, you know, all. I mean, the point is that uh, 
starting three years ago, everything was democratized uh, using, because everything, everybody can do it, it. I mean, everybody can download a lot of data and can use GitHub uh, software and actually produce the fix, which is something that, uh, you know, you, you, can, uh, you can feel uh, attacked if you think that everybody can uh, produce a deep fake of you. Thank you. <laughs> I think most of your points also goes back to what uh, Wild was mentioning. These days, you don't need uh, a big CPU, a big GPU. You don't need a yeah. specialized skill set. You go to a GitHub repo and then download this uh, data set. And I mean, I noticed that, yes, you're right. I noticed that if you want a very, very realistic uh, uh, solution, it can take a bit of time. I mean, if you have seen the um, Tom Cruise videos on TikTok, I mean, they, they at least the creators say that it took like uh, several months in order to do them perfectly. Even the President Nixon video took uh, six months in order to make it uh, completely realistic. So, of course, I mean, this is what happens, what happens now. Maybe in uh, last next year or even this year, it will take much uh, less time I mean, because uh, it's really uh, fast, uh, the technology. So it's something that we could never imagine. Uh, I could never imagine, I think, three years ago that the um, realism of synthetic phases was so good. It was something really astonishing. That brings me to the question, uh, Luisa. Um, you mentioned about this fa uh, face swap data set, right? So if you look at the images of the face swap, they, they appear very synthetic, most of the images. But why is the reason that most of the models fail to detect this uh, FS uh, face swap uh, images? Do you have any insights on why this might be happening? Uh, in terms, I mean, in the fact that visually you can see them and uh, then, then uh, okay, I think it depends on how you do training, I mean, what we experience is that uh, if uh, training and tests are aligned, uh, then detection is, can be very good. I mean, the main problem is when it is not aligned. Uh, and so you do not expect, uh, suppose that you find that you have a data set that do not present these visual artifacts in training and then you have them in test. Uh, maybe the network didn't know that. And so it was not trained in order to detect uh, those uh, artifacts. So in this respect, uh, it always depends on uh, the, the this, uh, this alignment between training and test. So what uh, also Vail talked about this distribution of shift, I mean, it's actually important. And the point is that you don't know uh, what you have in test. So I think that when you have a, a deep fake detector, you should always say when, what, which are the conditions uh, the working conditions of your deep fake detector. Otherwise, you know, people who are not in the field, maybe they can think that uh, it can solve all the problems, but you need uh, not to one single deep fake, you need several deep fake detectors, maybe trained in different ways, trying to look at different artifacts. And then, uh, uh, so that you can have a tool that is more general and robust. Yeah. So, I mean, the question was more from the point of, uh, uh, manipulation out of training, what you refer to as, right? So you have all the three other subsets, which is in the training set, and then you have FS, which is uh, face map, which is- Ah, okay, so, ah, okay, sorry, for the face forensics, uh, you mean for the face yeah. forensics data set? Okay, so the fact, so the point was that the experiment, oh, sorry, I didn't understand that. So the point was that the experiment we did uh, was uh, training on fascia reenactment and testing on Facebook, which was completely, a completely different type of uh, approach. So actually it was trained uh, to learn uh, the artifacts of face-to-face uh, -face, and then uh, in, in, in test there were face warping, which, which were a completely different artifact. So I think this was the point, the problem. The problem was not that they were visible, but I mean, the network was not uh, trained to learn those artifacts. Thank you, thank you for the clarification. Um, I, I'm also looking if there are any other questions, if somebody wants to unmute and ask the question. I have very fast questions, if there is no one. <laughs> Please go ahead. <laughs> uh, we have Luisa here, so I have that chance. Uh, a very non-technical question. In the, whom do you see is the main customer in the coming years for 
uh, deep fake or manipulation detection and why would we pay for it? I think that, uh, I mean, right now what I see in terms of interest uh, are uh, like, um, uh, okay, for example, uh, I mean, Facebook, Google are for sure interested in, uh, in, uh, in the detection because I mean, they, they are very big uh, companies uh, and have this uh, very big social network. So of course, I mean, they can be of interest and another, um, Governments uh, can actually be of interest. So, so people working in uh, for fact checking. I mean, I, I personally, I notice a lot of interest from uh, journalists and uh, people who actually would like to know when they receive data or videos or images if they are fake or not. Uh, so maybe maybe there can be like agencies uh, for uh, related to information. So journalists, etc., that can be interested in having uh, reliable tools for the detection. Of course, I mean, you know, before when someone, uh, um, like a journalist, give you a video or an image, you say, oh, great, I have a news. <laughs> and now you don't know what to do with uh, those images or video because you don't know if it is fake or not, which is, uh, of course, uh, they really would like to have like a tool, uh, a reliable tool to detect them. I don't know then in the future what can, could, could change because I imagine that a lot of things will be synthetic. So yeah. for example, um, I've seen, I mean, I've seen like actors that actually uh, created a deep fake for a publicity. I mean, uh, and uh, he, I mean, instead of going to the set or changing a country and taking the, you know, traveling, uh, you just uh, give the, you just say, okay, I, I, it's okay if you do a deep fake of me, I agree. So if you agree, you can actually give all the videos <laughs> or whatever, so it will be perfect. But you just sign and say, okay, use my deep fake, which is not a deep fake in the sense of a malicious because you are actually agreeing in uh, giving a sort of avatar where that uh, is actually acting for you in uh, in, a, in a movie or in this case it was a, a publicity a Russian publicity of an American actor and it was perfect actually and uh, he didn't have to go to Russia and uh, act <laughs> everything he just signed <laughs> and uh, received the money so I mean it's it's a it's a good application in a certain sense now yeah. for yeah. him it was for sure good I mean, it was a work with the uh, I mean, less effort, probably. There's a new economy in the sector. Right? Yes, it's new economy. You should not go there and there. I mean, with COVID, we learned a lot to do uh, work at a distance. And uh, of course, uh, I mean, for some, for some of our work, it can be of benefit. For conferences, workshops, of course, it's really not uh, the best solution to be at this. Yeah, this is not how I am. <laughs> yeah, no, I miss really a lot all the, all the contact uh, <laughs> at the conferences and the discussion, all the, you know, that it's completely different to, to do this in person, of course. Uh, Lisa, before before we um, uh, go to the next presentation, I have one last uh, question, yeah, or sure. maybe more of a comment from your side. Um, you mentioned about this content integrity management, right? And at one point of time, there was a surge of, uh, at least I read some articles which were claiming that they were using blockchain technology to, uh, to preserve the identity, um, the mm -hmm. integrity of TV videos. And this somehow disappeared. And now after three years or so, um, in some of the media platforms, at least in, in WhatsApp, I see that every time somebody forwards a video, there is a small icon that's coming up, which tells that this has been forwarded a couple of times, uh, multiple times. Ah, okay. So, I mean, they're they are, they are actually tracking the how many times it was. Uh, yeah, it's, it's nice that they are actually uh, giving information to people about how many times it was uh, it, it was posted actually on the, so it is great. Uh, for what concerns blockchain, I mean, there is a lot of interest in, you know, on this technology. I do not, I'm, I do not have experience on it. Uh, um, and I don't know which are the possible weaknesses of uh, this type of, in general, uh, of technologies where you apply active approaches. Uh, so when you want to protect the data, 
but I think it's important to explore different directions in order to understand, uh, uh, you know, if you put together different type of things, uh, then you can have a more robust and a more uh, uh, a solution that can be maybe use, useful also in realistic applications. So in general, it's important to consider different type of aspects. And if the like WhatsApp maybe can tell you even uh, this information, it's important in terms of also uh, uh, increasing the awareness of people. Because what is uh, something uh, uh, very important is education on people, like trying to make people realize that you can manipulate the data, you can manipulate uh, a video image, you cannot just, uh, not everything, uh, you cannot trust uh, just because you see it, uh, of course. And uh, this is something that many people, many common people, not people working, of course, in research, uh, don't know. I mean, um, my family, for example, when they started to see these manipulated videos or images, they were surprised about that. They said, oh, how can you do this? I mean, they, they, they look, really look real. So I think that uh, making people aware of this uh, uh, is also an important step uh, in, uh, in all this. And these type of initiatives uh, are important also. So this uh, saying, oh, pay attention, this was posted multiple times. Thank you, Louisa. I think this is the, the bad side of the uh, virtual conferences, right? Uh, it was it a physical conference, maybe. We could have, uh, <laughs> we like coffee and, together. <laughs> <laughs> okay. but, uh, next, maybe yeah. next time. Maybe uh, next time. It's, it's two years, I'm saying next time. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, okay, but, let's but, see. but we hope for next time, really next time. <laughs> okay. Um, once again, okay, thank, uh, thank you. you. Thank you again for inviting thank, me. Thank you very much, uh, Luisa, for accepting our invitation and uh, not the least uh, for staying up so late. I know it's quite late in uh, in Italy right now. No, no problem. No problem. Uh, not late as I thought at the beginning. No. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you so much, okay. Luisa. So then we go ahead with the next presentation. Bye bye. Bye bye. Then the next presentation is from um, Mahdi, and he will be yes. presenting on OTB morph, uh, which is one-time biometric biomorphing applied to face templates. Um, and this somehow is in connection, sorry, in line with the last talk of the previous session. The floor is all yours, Mahdi. Uh, hello, Kiran. Uh, do you have my voice? Yes, we hear you. Okay, let me share my uh, screen. Okay, can you see my slides? Um, now, yes. Okay. I think, yeah, let me see that. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my, my name is Mahdi Rafurian. Uh, I am an EUITN PhD student at the Biometrics and uh, Data Pattern Analytics Lab uh, in Universidad Autonoma de Madrid. Uh, I'm working on the security and privacy of uh, biometrics. Uh, today, I have the um, pleasure to uh, present our paper, uh, OTB Morph or One-Time Biometrics by Morphing Applied to Face Templates. Uh, okay, uh, sorry. Uh, first, I would like to give a brief background about uh, the, the research topics uh, that, uh, this, uh, res uh, that the, our paper is uh, pursuing. Uh, then I would uh, I will delve into the detail of uh, our proposed method. Um, well, actually, uh, our research is uh, categorized under uh, biometric template protection methods. Uh, biometric template protections are a group of techniques that uh, we are using mainly to preserve security and privacy related to individual characteristics. Uh, among these techniques, cancelable approaches are very interesting due to their unique features, such as providing revocability and uh, non-invertibility and et cetera. Uh, however, uh, cancelable uh, templates of individuals, which is uh, stored on template storage during enrollment phases uh, is somehow permanent and uh, won't change until uh, a predetermined uh, due date or an expiration date date uh, or reporting security breach. Uh, it happens uh, normally this way because uh, we usually need to uh, offer user convenience and uh, 
reduce communication costs. However, uh, this issue uh, breeds a couple of uh, security problems that uh, needs to be uh, taken into account. Uh, we uh, we uh, proposed uh, a new cancellable uh, approach called uh, OTB Morph, uh, which is uh, classified as a visual cryptographic method. Uh, there are multiple attack points, uh, and generally in a biometric, uh, in a generic uh, biometric systems, uh, we uh, address and we try to address uh, three types of security challenges that are possible to be occurred uh, at some of these attack points. Uh, in a specific, in most uh, biometric verification systems, uh, it is possible uh, for anyone. Uh, or anyone actually is permitted to request to be verified as the person uh, they claim they are by guessing or obtaining the user ID or user code of the victim. Uh, therefore, uh, the biometric system uh, fetch the template, fetch the template uh, or reference of the victim from the template storage to the matching module every time. Uh, this issue uh, brings about uh, the emergence of leakage attacks, uh, such as side channel attacks, backdoor attacks, Trojan, and et cetera, at attack point three. Uh, therefore, an attacker uh, is able to obtain uh, the similarity score in some uh, verification sessions, not necessarily consecutive, and do iterative optimization uh, in order to maximize uh, the similar, in order to maximize the similarity of an arbitrary face uh, to that of victim. Uh, during our uh, experiments, we observed that uh, the attacker is able to lower the Euclidean distance uh, of her arbitrary face to that of victim uh, in a small number of iterations and uh, get a high matching score. In addition to that, uh, it is possible for the attacker to inject a synthesized feature vector uh, from attack point two uh, and override feature extractor uh, in order to impersonate the, the genuine user. Uh, during, uh, our, uh, our and during our uh, experiments, we practiced various transformation methods uh, for cancellable biometrics, such as uh, applying uh, pepper and salt noise, applying uh, Gaussian noise, applying imploding transformation and some other functions, uh, trying to uh, stop uh, iterative optimizations. Uh, however, uh, we found that, uh, that none of these methods could stop uh, the attack because uh, regardless uh, of the uh, transformation we applied, in the end, the generated template, the protected template needs to be similar uh, to the reference um, to, for example, in order to have a, a proficient face recognition systems, uh, we cannot uh, uh, we cannot add uh, much noise or use, for example, very chaotic uh, transformation functions uh, because uh, it results in uh, destroying unique features uh, of uh, our individuals and uh, and it uh, therefore uh, decrease the performance of uh, our, our biometric systems. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in a biometric verification systems, uh, the generated template of uh, the same individual uh, in different verification sessions are quite similar to each other because uh, they were, they were uh, transformed using uh, the same uh, function. Uh, all these similarities um, is sufficient for an attacker to do iterative optimization. Uh, in order to uh, address this challenge uh, and uh, while uh, preserving uh, the performance of uh, the biometric system, uh, we uh, proposed a one-time biometric, uh, which, is in, which is inspired by uh, the concept of a uh, one-time uh, path, uh, uh, which, uh, which, use face which we use face morphing as a transformation function for cancellable biometric. Uh, in a specific, uh, during enrollment phase, uh, we captured um, when when user face is captured, uh, user inputs a, a new a random face image to the transformation function. Uh, this um, this face image uh, we, in our uh, in our implementation we used LFW data sets uh, and we picked a random face image. But uh, this face image 
image can be, for example, again, a, a synthesized uh, again curated uh, face image. Uh, then these two images uh, are morphed uh, and the result is stored as a user reference on uh, templated storage. Uh, in the end, uh, the, the random face image is recorded on user device as uh, current auxiliary data. Uh, subsequently, uh, in each verification session, uh, when user face is captured, uh, the previously uh, recorded random face uh, image, uh, known as current auxiliary data, is uh, extracted from user device. Uh, then these two images are morphed, and the result is compared with the reference on template storage. Uh, if they match, user face uh, is captured once more and morphed together with a new random face image uh, known as a new auxiliary data. Uh, the result is called re-enrollment uh, and it replaces the previous uh, reference on template storage. Finally, uh, the new random face image supersedes the previous one on, uh, on user device. Uh, as a result, while uh, the distance between, uh, between the templates, which were morphed using the same auxiliary data is low, that of morphed by different auxiliary data is high. Uh, this technique actually tries to uh, highly try to uh, decrease the convergence space uh, of, uh, of attacker of iterative optimization for the attacker. Uh, during uh, our implementation, uh, we, um, we implemented uh, four different scenarios on a Casio and VGG phase two data sets in the presence of an attacker who is able to, uh, do, um, to do iterative optimization. Uh, from left column to right, uh, the, the implementation, the methods that we implemented is uh, are, uh, the, um, without any protection method, uh, applying Gaussian noise. Uh, applying uh, imploding transformation and applying the proposed method. Uh, the first row uh, is the comparison of attacker matching the score, while the second row is uh, the uh, performance difference between, uh, diff between each scenarios. We observed that uh, for both uh, data sets, uh, the falling rate uh, of the attacker uh, matching a score in the proposed method is quite, is quite lower than uh, other scenarios. Uh, for example, it can be seen that uh, while in the uh, first uh, three scenarios, the attacker matching the score uh, fell below uh, 0.9 after only uh, 40 iterations or verification sessions, uh, it stands uh, above that value uh, for the proposed method. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the, pro um, uh, the proposed method offer better performance as the overlapping region uh, for the imposter and genuine score is quite smaller than uh, other scenarios. Uh, we achieved our results uh, with regard to uh, equal error rate, uh, FRR, FRR at uh, different FAR points and attack successful rate at all these points. Uh, however, for the interest of time, uh, I only explained uh, equal error rate and attack success rate at EUR. Uh, you can uh, take a look at our paper uh, for the full table. Uh, we observed that uh, imploding has the worst performance on both Cassia and VG Phase 2. Uh, the highest attack success rate uh, can be seen on the um, scenario one, just with it without any protection method. Uh, Nevertheless, the proposed method uh, excels uh, in both lowering uh, attack success rate and uh, offering better performance. Uh, for example, uh, in case of attack success rate at EOR point, uh, the proposed method, uh, the attack success rate for the proposed method is almost half of the worst scenario. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I would be happy if you have, uh, to answer a question. Thank you, Madi. Um, I'm just looking for any questions. Okay. If you, I don't see any questions. But if you go back to the slide where you showed the um, the illustration of number of pictures, Madin, I think it was here? one before. Yeah, here. Yeah. Um, so, wh why would you term it as VoTB, one time, one time biometric, right? Yeah. 
Yes. Because it's, it, it looks there is a lot of iterative optimization happening in here. Yes. Yes. Because uh, you know uh, each each of these are very are one verification sessions. For example, when you present your face to your uh, bank application, each time that you want to uh, open, to access your bank application is is one session is uh, regarded as one session. So uh, in each when uh, usually in cancellable biometrics, your uh, reference that is in uh, for example in uh, in the bank, it is always uh, the same. It, it, it won't change. But uh, an attacker can, uh, if if he can uh, get the matching score and he can uh, repeat, and re uh, he can repeat, uh, send his his uh, face, for example, uh, in um, in place of you, and uh, and can get the score from uh, by a leakage by a leakage attack. He can uh, do iterative optimization, and uh, finally he can uh, fine tune an arbitrary face and. Uh, in, impersonate himself uh, as, as you. Uh, but uh, in this method, uh, in each verification session, uh, we change the reference of you in, in the database of the server. So the attacker, uh, as you can see, uh, for example, in each, uh, in each uh, session, when the attacker uh, tried to do iterative optimization, uh, in each session, he's, uh, he uh, see a different uh, face. So uh, he cannot um, do the iterative optimization very well, and he cannot find uh, fine tune his uh, picture. I see. Thank you, Madi. Um, just just a small uh, sub question. Uh, I, I'm not seeing any other questions. If uh, somebody has it, please unmute your microphone, and then you can ask the question. Um, in the meanwhile, I can ask you one other question. Did you have any studies on revocability and uh, unlinkability? Uh, and the unlinkability. Um, you know, uh, the cancellable biometrics uh, are methods that, uh, for example, for biometric template protection, uh, they are um, they are famous for the revocability because if they uh, leak, you can uh, revoke it and uh, create a new um, templates. So, um, but uh, I think this uh, this method that we, we uh, claim that because it is one time. Uh, it, it is uh, it revokes uh, in every sessions the the, um, the templates that you have. So the, that's the power of our method because uh, we do not uh, let, uh, for example, a security breach to be reported. So we take a precaution and change it uh, at every time and revoke it at, at after every after every session. That I think that answers my question. Um, maybe we can talk about um, unlinkability at some some other instance. Uh, thank you again, Madi. Yeah, you're um, welcome. This is in, my the, in the spirit of time, maybe we can go to the next presentation. Uh, the next presentation is saliency guided textured contact lens aware iris recognition. Uh, Lucas Parisianello will be presenting, if I'm not wrong. Uh, right. Can you hear me? Yes, Lucas, we can hear you now. Great. Um... So, aloha, I'm Lucas Parzanello from the University of Notre Dame, uh, and I'll present the work uh, I've been doing with Dr. Adam Jaika on saliency guided uh, texture contact lens aware iris recognition. Um, so, we've been working on this iris recognition problem uh, with limited information, or more specifically, we want to perform the recognition when the unidentified subject is wearing a texture contact lens. Uh, so in order to do that, we take advantage of how these cosmetic or these textured contact lenses are built. Um, even though they cover almost the entirety of the iris, uh, some of the region around the pupil often remains uh, uncovered by the contact lens uh, because uh, this opening in the middle allows for light uh, to go through without being infected uh, and accounts for pupil dilation. Um, therefore, the idea of this project is to use the uh, authentic information um, around the pupil for matches, uh, as you can see in the left uh, hand side picture here. Uh, so some terminology for us. Um, our goal is to determine whether an image of a subject wearing a texture contact lens um, the, the probe in the uh, right picture is um, or not a match for an enrolled or live image on the left. Uh, we can see the contact lens pattern on the right hand side um, that is affecting the iris pattern. 
and the authentic iris texture annotated uh, with the, uh, the green region here. Um, so as you can imagine, this is not exactly an ideal scenario um, where the recommended percentage of visible iris by the international standards is 70% or above. Uh, and these two curves show how much our structure that we can actually observe in the um, in, in, in our data set that we're actually using. Most of the images uh, don't even reach 15% of the iris uh, texture usable for a match, uh, while almost no sample goes beyond uh, half of what's recommended, um, 35%. Um, so uh, our solution is uh, divided in two components, um, each one, uh, each of these two components solving a different problem um, and, and performed by different models. Uh, one is the segmenter and the other is a matcher. The first one is the texture contact lens aware segmenter. So every time you see TCLA, that means texture contact lens aware. Um, and the TCLA segmenter is a deep learning model based on Mosca CNN that is fine tuned uh, on human annotated data to segment the contacts uh, for the iris texture um, itself, just like that green area show you before. Um, so we use a subset of the Notre Dame photometric um, studio iris data set, which originally contains uh, 5,700 images. Uh, we manually annotated um, over 1,100 of these images, um, which are the ones that um, have uh, subjects actually wearing the texture contact lens. Uh, and um, uh, so in, we annotated them in a, in a, using a binary mask in a way that um, the iris texture is, like the, the authentic iris texture is separated uh, from the contact lens texture. So using the data, uh, this data, this annotated data, we fine tune our mask standard model. Uh, to perform this finer segmentation in order to, to pass um, the resulting mask um, to the TCLA matcher later, uh, as, as I will describe later. Uh, this is an evaluation of the TCLA segmenter uh, on the right, uh, and it shows an intersection of reunion above 0 0.5 on uh, nearly uh, three quarters of the images that we had in, in our um, uh, data set. These images are not, uh, are, are left out um, from the segmenter uh, training procedure. Uh, and an IUU above 0 0.9 um, um, for um, uh, a lot of the images in the data set. So uh, moving on to the TCLA matcher, uh, the matcher is a Siamese neural network model that uh, returns the distance of a given pair of irises. Uh, the probe iris have uh, uh, the probe irises have their regions of interest predicted by, by the TCLA segmenter, as I showed before, uh, while the regular uh, segmenter is applied on the enrolled images. So the enrolled images are assumed to be live uh, without any texture contact, contact lens. Um, so you get to use um, um, ordinary uh, uh, segment uh, segmentation models um, for that part. And then uh, we apply the TCLA segmenter on the uh, image wearing a texture contact lens. Um, and uh, uh, the loss on, on the right side is, is calculated for a pair of uh, input images. Um, for example, a contrastive loss. Uh, in our experience, however, we, um, we obtain better results using triple loss instead of contrastive loss. Um, and a triple loss uh, would take an anchor, a positive, and a negative sample. Uh, where the anchor would be the um, enrolled image, uh, the positive would be the genuine counterpart, and the negative would be the oh, I'm sorry, and the negative would be the um, uh, the imposter counterpart of that anchor. Um, moreover, the TCLA matcher uses uh, is based off of uh, ResNet uh, 18 as a backbone. Uh, and it outputs a real number that represents the Euclidean distance between these uh, embedding representations of the, the two irises. Um, this matching distance uh, can be later thresholded for uh, a binary decision. Now, uh, moving on to the normalization. Uh, this, is a rubber, uh, uh, this is a rubber sheet normalization on the left, um, which uh, has no information about the preocular region. 
And on the right, we have the R-centric or cropped um, um, normalization in which most of the periocular uh, information is removed, uh, but the spatial convex, uh, which is especially useful for uh, convolution neural network based, uh, based models is, is preserved. Um, so we tried these two normalization uh, types here. Um, and um, also uh, besides the normalization and, and also cropping the images, uh, we also investigated the effects of two kinds of saliency guidance. Um, one is Gaussian blur uh, in the middle and random noise on the right. Uh, so the idea behind the usage of a spatial saliency guidance, uh, uh, guidance by the uh, proposed segmenter is to guide the matching model, um, the, the training process of the uh, Siamese network model uh, towards regions containing um, unincluded iris or the, the um, iris patches that actually make a difference um, in determining whether the uh, the two images are a match or not. Um, so we don't want to use binary masks here because they create uh, strong image gradients, uh, which could um, result in fake features uh, that are not really related to, to a particular identity um, or identity uh, match. Uh, so instead we examine these uh, two approaches, um, the first one removes, uh, the Gaussian blur removes the high frequency information uh, from known salient regions by blurring these. And the other one, um, the random noise, uh, replaces non salient regions with random noise, uh, which we uh, hope that should discourage the network from actually using uh, these uh, noisy image regions. Uh, so by doing that, the Siamese network is uh, co coached. Uh, during training on which regions um, they, uh, it, it should be um, taken into account for uh, producing matches. Now, um, we compared each combination of normalization and statistic guidance to determine the effects of each change in the final distributions. Uh, these experiments were trained on randomly sampled uh, images to form a train and a validation set. Uh, and these numbers are the sensitivity indices or D prime values. Uh, so a D prime value is a measure of distance between two normal, two uh, assumed to be normal distributions uh, that have different means and different standard deviations. Uh, in our case, every time uh, we refer to D prime, we're measuring this difference between uh, the genuine and the imposter pairs in the distribution. Um, and such as uh, these ones. The greater uh, this value is, the greater the D prime is, uh, the better the classifier in question is. Um, so these D prime values were uh, obtained for, from their um, uh, respective validation sets here in this table. Um, and while testing, uh, the testing set is left out for the final comparison against the baseline that I'll be showing later. Uh, each cell in this table here uh, summarizes the average of five independent executions uh, with one standard deviation in parentheses um, among these five um, executions. Uh, so in the first column, we have uh, the control group that does not use any saliency. Uh, the images were provided as they are with normalization or just iris cropping. Uh, these empirical results show that the preprocessing method that combines uh, both the Gaussian blur saliency with uh, iris normalization uh, perform better than the others. Uh, and that replacing the contact lens texture with random noise uh, seems to be even more harmful in the learning process than not using any saliency. Um, so, Moving on to the comparison with the human-driven uh, BSIF matcher. So the motivation of this is to evaluate our TCLA matcher, uh, the contact lens aware matcher, uh, against the baseline. Uh, since we could not find any matcher that was specifically designed for the problem of subjects wearing a texture contact lens, uh, we then um, uh, chose to use the uh, state-of-the-art iris recognition method, uh, which is uh, BISIF based, um, BISIF meaning binarized uh, statistical image features, uh, and that it computes the Hamming distances of the iris codes derived from the images. 
for our problem, these um, iris codes were masked using the uh, masks predicted by the TCLA segmenter um, in order to discard the information of the texture contact lens themselves. Uh, themselves. So uh, in other words, we're uh, comparing the BASIF matcher to the TCLA matcher using uh, the TCLA segmenter to create the masks for both methods. Um, so we're comparing um, one matcher against the other. Uh, by comparing, uh, by using the same segmentation masks, um, uh, we we hope to to produce a, a fair evaluation uh, of only these matches themselves. So um, the adaptation of human driven the SIF to uh, textual wear uh, iris recognition, uh, we performed the um, selection of sets of filters. Um, these uh, uh, BISIF uh, filter sets changing number of uh, uh, changing number of filters and changing size as well. Uh, so to make again a fair comparison, we analyze the best combination uh, for this task at hand. Uh, this table shows the fitness as the sens sensitivity index of uh, each set of filters on the data for matches using uh, the new annotated masks. So under normal circumstances, uh, it's not uncommon to, to find a sensitivity index, a D prime value uh, above six using this method. Uh, yet here we see that the most suited filter sets uh, achieve a D prime uh, of 0 0.7, 0 0.76. Um, and uh, really none of these uh, filter sets offer a really good accuracy um, for this problem. Uh, so, Again, despite being state of the regular matching. Um, so following the, this baseline comparison, we chose the best filter sets, um, um, the, uh, the best filter set combination uh, from the previous slide and plotted the distributions of genuine imposter matches uh, using that versus uh, our TCLA matcher. Um, so these two curves here indicate um, um, the, uh, ind indicate probe irises uh, when they are compared against the second enrolled iris. Uh, so in blue, we have the genuine pairs, uh, and in magenta, we have imposter pairs. Ideally, in a good matcher, uh, we want these two curves uh, well separated and without any overlap uh, in, in between them. Um, that correlates with a high sensitivity index. Uh, on the left, we have the curves for the BISIF matcher with the best filter set um, selected for this test. And on the right, our TCLA matcher uh, using blur as uh, saliency along with normalization, just, just like we, we saw it was the best combination uh, on that table. Um, so we're comparing the best scenario for both classifiers here and see how, how they perform against each other, basically. Uh, the TCLA matcher outperforms the, the BISIF method with a D prime uh, almost three times greater uh, and a reduction of the equal error rate from 33% to 11%. Uh, while this is far from perfect, uh, it's worth remembering that many samples have less than 15% of the iris visible uh, that it, when, when the recommended 70. Uh, so um, this represents a significant improvement on the iris recognition under uh, these particular circumstances. Um, so the takeaway is, is that for us, um, we show that, the, the, um, hopefully show that the texture contact lens aware um, iris recognition is possible um, at a lower confidence rate, but still much better than a random chance uh, and better than the state of the art method that assumes a, a live or a clear iris. Uh, even when this method is uh, paired with a contact lens aware segmentation as we did in our experiments. Uh, second, the saliency guided version uh, using the uh, Gaussian blur performed uh, better than no saliency <clears throat> and, um, and random noise, um, uh, better than no, no saliency and random noise um, to replace regions to be ignored. This indicates that the training process can be guided uh, in a way that increases both the accuracy uh, and also the human interoperability uh, of the solution. Uh, and 
Finally, the models uh, generated um, and the data set annotations um, are publicly available at this GitHub location here. Um, so with that said, uh, I thank you all for the attention and I hope to meet you all in person one day. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lucas. We should keep the hopes uh, alive. Um, I have a, yeah. I, I don't know if there is any questions from the audience, but in the meanwhile, I can ask one question. Uh, Nazar has a question. Maybe I should let Nazar ask a question first. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lucas, for the interesting talk. Uh, one small technical thing. Uh, how did you choose your triplets? My triplets. So um, we, um, they are randomly selected. Um, we, we, we performed the hard triplet mining uh, but perhaps for some uh, quirk in, 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 in the data set where all these triplets were being selected, uh, I was not getting good results with the hard triplet mining. Um, so they were actually uh, random, uh, randomly selected um, uh, from the ones available. Yeah, thank you. It, 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 because you have these information about, um... You, you have because you have a let's say non usual mask um, might be that one can link the mask overlap with how to select the triplets it's just a thought it's nothing that's, yeah but it's mm -hmm. very interesting mm -hmm. work you can see the, the shift in the performance uh, congrats yeah that's but that, 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 that's a good point i think i think the the, the triplet selection needs uh, needs more work and uh, uh, this is like a first exploration on that um, um, okay. challenge. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you. Lucas, I have um, I have a question on slide number six. You showed the um, the images that you are sending to the Siamese network. Uh, just a second, uh, slide six. Yeah, here. So um, is it the same pair of the images or is it random images? I mean, with with, with, with um, contactless and without contactless. Uh, you mean you, you mean this specific example, mm -hmm. or uh, generally um, when, when you when you did your approach, when you created your approach, did you pair them using the same iris which had contactless and which did not have contactless, or was it any? With any? Yeah, yeah. So 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 uh, the when 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 is the same subject or the same iris? Uh, with and without contact lens, I'm calling that a genuine pair. Um, that that which should be a match. Uh, when when they're different uh, subjects, uh, it's it's an imposter pair. So uh, I, I I'm not sure about this particular example here. Uh, uh, but um, um, so every, every pair that you see in blue here uh, are supposed to be from the same subject. And every pair that you see in, in, in magenta is supposed to be an imposter pair, meaning two different uh, subjects. No, my, my question was more on, on the, at the training part, right? Uh, comparison part is fine, but while you're training, uh, did you put them as a pair with and without? Um, with and without contact lens? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so that that yeah. these um, uh, these combinations included in training, yes. Right. So, so I, I think then in that case there there should be something that is not going um, exactly right. With contrast to loss, it might be some parameters. It might be worth giving a a new try with contrast to loss again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's certainly a possibility. Yeah. Um, I, I I don't think we we. Um, we ran out of uh, of, of options uh, regarding the um, the fine tuning, like the uh, the improvement of, of the loss function, uh, and uh, there's still a lot to be to be explored in that regard. Uh, I also noticed from the figures that uh, the the eyelashes are differently placed. Maybe it might have played a role. Uh, you have Adam. Adam is an expert in iris recognition, so it might be interesting to look at the sectored um, sectored areas, right? Just take the areas mm -hmm. that are clean enough, let's say half the circle, and then just rely on that. Yeah, I, yeah so um, uh -huh. Adam, oh. hey. I don't want to interrupt you. 
Hello, everyone. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> uh, good to see you virtually, <laughs> at least. Yeah. So, um, Kiran, thanks for uh, great questions. Actually, so the, the idea here was to check the idea, check the idea, the idea was to check the idea, uh, how uh, guiding the neural network works when you have very, very little, little information. And this information is seen in this slide. So, so we actually on purpose blurred everything except this very tiny amount of um, iris pattern mm -hmm. to see if the network can actually learn anything from this, right? So the network is, this is why it is called saliency guided because we just provide the network, we, we tell the network, okay, here is something that is important. Everything that is blurred because we remove high frequency components. This is something that you should not probably take into account when, when training. That was the idea. So, so of course, eyelashes, everything in, in the ocular region could be useful. Uh, but that, as Lucas said, it was just a first step just to see if this kind of training can, can help uh, in that particular application. I see. But I let Lucas to answer this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it was just, a, just an idea, maybe, maybe for the extension. Yeah, just a quick... Uh... Uh, mention about the eyelashes. Uh, uh, they are, if, if not totally removed, uh, like a good um, uh, portion of them removed uh, with the normalized versions, uh, which are the ones um, actually used in the final experiments um, that perform better. Uh, so uh, ju just a parenthesis. For that. I see. Thank you, Lucas. Um, I think it was very interesting, uh, interesting talk. Um, thank you for the questions. Thank you, Adam, for stepping in and answering. And now we go to the very last uh, presentation for those of you who have been listening to the talks and then thinking that, okay, more or less all the things are solved. There is a new database that is created by uh, Qualcomm AI. And this will be a personalized benchmark for face anti-spoofing and Davide will present if I'm not wrong. That's correct. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? We can hear you, David. All right. Let me share my screen. Can you also see my slides now? Yes, we do that. That's great. Uh, one second. Yes. All right. So I'm David. Um, thank you for uh, hosting this event. Very interesting so far. And uh, today we'll present our work, a personalized benchmark for face and spoofing, collaboration with the Basman Bent uh, and Fatih in uh, Qualcomm AI research. So, in uh, well, we discuss enough today the task of face and spoofing, but brief reminder is that we want to classify face images between live, so from real users, and spoof, so copies or replays of the live images from the users. And what we observe is that in the existing solutions, so in the literature, uh, most of the, of, the, of the papers look at uh, training uh, and spoofing models on large data sets, which try to encapsulate all the different conditions like subject sensors, spoof types, et cetera, which can uh, happen at test time. However, at test time, the, the model itself only sees uh, uh, the current input, but doesn't have any uh, information about the current subject and sensor that uh, it has to be classified. In other words, the input query image we want to classify is fed to the model in an example uh, deep neural network and the output is a live or spoof prediction. In contrast, what we try to do in this work is to look at the, a personalized solution for anti-spoofing. This comes from the observation that in an uh, anti-spoofing system, the, the in real application, uh, the solution is usually paired with the user recognition system or a matching algorithm, which uh, relies on disenrollment data. We've seen it in uh, uh, eyes and faces in other domains, but uh, all in all, it's a collection of a live sample from the subject, which are used as a reference for the matching. And uh, what we what we hypothesize or what we argue is that this um, collection of live samples can also be useful for the anti-spoofing task since they provide a live reference for the current subject and the, the anti-spoofing model can benefit from this information. In other words, we suggest uh, an approach to anti-spoofing where the neural network 
does not only have access to the input query to be classified, but also to an enrollment set, a collection of live uh, samples for the current user. So briefly on the related word, uh, as I said, uh, the focus of recent research is uh, um, aiming mostly at creating new datasets and, uh, and the solutions. For datasets, we try to expand the number of um, collection conditions and data modalities, provide more information to our system. So two of the most recent data sets try to address this. Celebate spoof from 2020 looks at different uh, poses and illumination condition for spoofs. And Wi-Fi mask look at different materials and uh, light sources and colors. And many other papers look at different architectures and training objectives to optimize anti-spoofing performance. There's not much work on the front of personalization, however. Uh, we found uh, some work in uh, different domains, for example, audio anti-spoofing or speaker verification, which showed uh, promising results. Um, but for face anti-spoofing, most, the, most of the personalization work uh, just looks at uh, tuning the thresholds for anti-spoofing. So the, basically the, the boundary, decision boundary between live and spoof of the model or using uh, enrollment data for data augmentation. So to expand the, um, the data for the training. However, we couldn't find a solution that actually uh, personalized the, the model itself in the, in the sense of updating it or giving extra information from, uh, from the current subject, so enrollment data. To that extent, we propose um, a simple method that adapt existing benchmarks by introducing enrollment sets paired with each, with each uh, query to be classified. And um, each, each subject is a unique uh, fixed enrollment set as uh, we, we see in real scenarios. For example, when you uh, have a new phone, you start using it for the first time, then you enroll, enroll your, uh, your images or fingerprint um, for the, sorry, faces or fingerprint images. And uh, this creates kind of a collection, which is uh, then kept the same throughout all the device lifetime. For this reason, when we create our, our uh, benchmark, we have a fixed uh, enrollment set for each subject. Uh, the enrollment set can be varied depending on uh, the study we want to conduct. In our case, we use uh, five enrollment uh, images per uh, user, but there are different variations. That's a hyperparameter. In a nutshell, um, the data point from the original data set is described simply by the query image and label for the image, so live or spoof. Well, in our current uh, um, proposed alternative, we also introduce an enrollment set, which is a set of uh, live images from the same subject and sensor. Uh, with this simple method, we um, apply it to two of the most recent data sets, celibate spoof and uh, SAW or spoofing in the wild. And uh, we show here some uh, well, the population of the data set and some examples to um, showcase how the uh, the gallery of enrollment images for each subject provides extra information in terms of uh, pose, illumination, or color for the face of the person, which can be used as an extra uh, reference to classify and see live and spoof samples for the same subject. Um, as the next contribution, we also introduced a few simple baselines uh, to benchmark the effectiveness of uh, using enrollment data for the personalization of anti-spoofing. We do so with a um, simple model conditioning. So we just feed uh, the additional source of data, the enrollment uh, to the anti-spoofing model. In, in practice, this is done uh, in the following way. We have a uh, first a feature extraction um, through a CNN backbone. We tried a few different ones, uh, but basically this feature extraction, uh, uh, well, processes the original images from query and from the enrollment set into latent visual features. This is done for both the query and enrollment images. And then we have a, an aggregation function which uh, combines all the um, features from the different enrollment images into a compressed representation. The query features and the enrollment features are finally um, fed through uh, a classifier, which learns how to compare these two representation, the query we want to classify and the live reference to finally obtain a live or spoof prediction. In this backbone, it's, uh, this architecture is important to notice that all the part or most of the part that involves enrollment uh, is independent of the query. So we can uh, pre-process this uh, uh, 
uh, latent enrollment information once for each subject, and then make sure that there are no extra overhead for compute and memory during uh, test time. We didn't discuss details of this aggregation function. Uh, that's because we tried uh, a few variations. We'll show also in the ablation studies. Um, here are the, the ones we considered. We tried a few simple ones like concatenation and mean of enrollment features just to aggregate them in some way. But then we also tried more expressive parametric functions like uh, recurring neural networks. Uh, in this case, uh, get a recurring unit. Uh, attention, where we basically have um, attention between the query uh, features and the different enrollment features to try and um, find the best way to weight them. And also graph neural network, which is a more even more expressive way to learn this, um, uh, this relation, these combinations. And the purpose of this, again, is to uh, find a way to aggregate all these enrollment features from different images in a unique representation. Finally, we uh, evaluate the proposed uh, solution on this, uh, these new benchmarks. Um, we consider three KPIs for our evaluation. The first is an uh, area under the curve between uh, the APCR or BPCR. We also have a AUC at 10. What does it mean? Is that we compute the AUC between 0 and 10% BPCR. And this basically captures the, the region uh, where we can ensure good user experience. If you're using your device on a daily basis, you wouldn't want to be rejected most of the times. Uh, so in, in, with this metric, we basically look at this kind of range for the spoofing solution. Um, of course, this depends on the application we are considering. And finally, the equal error rate between uh, APCR and BPCR. So let's look at some numbers. Um, as I said, we, we are comparing a, a baseline method, so a simple and spoofing solution, and against the same solution where the extra um, enrollment inputs are provided. We uh, evaluate on a cell-based proof and the SAW uh, dataset over different uh, backbones, VGG, ResNet, and FederNet, which is a lightweight uh, uh, and spoofing uh, architecture. And uh, we observe that over all these factors, over all these uh, configurations, we have a small but consistent improvement using personalization in these uh, pretty high uh, AUC ranges, which shows that our, our method can indeed uh, improve uh, over the baseline, even with such a simple uh, formulation. We also ran some uh, ablation studies, the first of which to um, uh, investigate which aggregation function is the best. And here, surprisingly, we noticed that uh, concatenation and mean, which are the most simple and uh, non-parametric functions, are actually uh, improving uh, with respect to the most, expre most more expressive ones. And um, we hypothesized that this is because the uh, final NLP classifier is uh, uh, enough to learn the correlation or like the, the, the relation between query and enrollment features. And no fancy um, aggregation function is needed to recombine enrollment uh, features from different images. We also have a study on, uh, an application study on the future encoder. We were wondering if we can uh, uh, use the same weights, the same actual um, yeah, weights for the uh, feature extractor for the query and enrollment features. And we noticed that uh, if we have a time weights or shared weights between the two, the performance is actually suboptimal with respect to the baseline. Uh, this is also a bit surprising, and it hints towards um, the necessity to extract different type of information from query and enrollment image. Finally, we have an ablation study on uh, the enrollment set size. Uh, here we uh, fix the test set and we compare uh, the behavior of the anti spoofing model when we change the amount of uh, images, enrollment images that it can see. Um, of course, if we have a zero, this is the non-personalized model, so the baseline, which is uh, uh, suboptimal. If we have one, we have some improvements, both for AC10 and uh, ER. And uh, we notice that having more enrollment images is, uh, is even better. Uh, the improvement is uh, um, marginal, but still we, we, we uh, see that more information from the uh, subject is, uh, is helping with the anti-spoofing task. For these two datasets and these models, two and four uh, enrollment images are the best. 
So to wrap up, we are, our contributions are that we uh, first um, propose an spoofing solution that is improved through personalization and can be used when enrollment data is available. This of course depends on the, on the applications. Um, we introduce a method to simulate enrollment data in existing datasets. And this can be used for any uh, face in the spoofing or uh, even finger or eye data set, which has subject information. And finally, we proposed uh, some simple uh, baselines to showcase that personalization actually uh, improves over different uh, data sets and backbones. We have a couple of directions for future works. Uh, first is to investigate the effectiveness of this um, uh, personalization on the latest anti-spoofing uh, architectures. We work with uh, some uh, simple backbones or Federnet, but there are more complicated uh, uh, networks with uh, multi multiple uh, input sources or uh, yeah, uh, re recent uh, development that could be um, further improved with this personalization. And finally, uh, we argue that some, uh, some better method or module to use this enrollment data could uh, further improve uh, with respect to our simple model conditioning. And uh, with this, I thank you all for the attention and uh, I'm happy to answer uh, any question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Davide. It was a very interesting talk to the end of the uh, session as well. Uh, I'm just seeing if there are any questions from the audience. No questions so far. In that case, I have a question for you on the slide number 11, Davide, if you go back to slide number 11. Yes. So here you, you, you note that it's two and four are optimal, right? Yeah. Um, and in, in um, Acacia, you have uh, nine, four as optimal and uh, SAW have nine, two as optimal. Um, wh was there any specific reason? Did you observe any discrepancies between the I don't know, characteristics of the data, or um, did you continue increasing it to, I don't know, 16 enrollment samples or so? Right. Mm. So when, when you talk about uh, discrepancy, is it about uh, between the two data sets? Yeah, or... between the two data sets. Yeah, OK. So I can give a brief answer that uh, the two data sets are fairly different. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the reason is that in uh, Celebase Poop, we have a Kind of unrelated pictures um, from the from the subject, uh, and the spoofs also are kind of unrelated. While in SLW, the images are extracted from videos, so there there is this temporal correlation. Um, when we create the enrollment sets, we of course make sure that there is no overlap between uh, the data we evaluate and the data we use for enrollment. But uh, um, the, the the actual definition of the two data sets is a bit different. So this in part might. Uh, um, cause the difference between the two data sets. There are other uh, data sets in both categories, um, which we might consider for future work. And there we might see some similarities uh, depending on, uh, on this. And um, answer your second question. Um, we, we tried uh, some different uh, sizes of enrollment set. And one limitation is that the larger your enrollment set is, um, the more data from this subject you should have. For example, in Celebase Poof, uh, we have that uh, the number of a sample, live sample per subject range between uh, one and 40, something like that. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have a very big enrollment set, it's not really feasible. No. Uh, for this reason, we, we looked at these, uh, these ranges here. Uh, thank you, David. Um, I have a follow-up question. If you go to the next slide, it's uh, slide number... So 12, yeah. So if I look at the images in the enrollment set, they don't seem to be very neutral in terms of expression, which is uh, which is not very similar to what we have in realistic applications, right? In most of the bank applications, most of the passport applications, they ask you to take a picture with a neutral pose. Do you think this might have played a role in, um, in not improving the performance to to larger degree? Uh, right. So uh, this example here is from Celebes proof, and in that case, indeed, there is a, a very large variation between all images. Um, if we look at the other data set, SW, in that case, the, the images are much more similar per enrollment set. So if I jump back to this um, um, second, 
yeah, here. So the bottom two lines, I think these are more realistic with respect to how a user enrolls when it starts using a device. Sometimes they ask you to just rotate your face or rotate the device around your face, uh, which probably is a bit more uh, realistic. I see. So it's, yeah. it's more of, a, um, uh, let's say, realistic use case scenarios that you're considered, not uh, standard bank scenarios or passport scenarios. Yeah, we didn't consider a specific scenario, but the one we had in mind for evaluation was uh, daily use of uh, your device. So not high security, for example, that's why we had the uh, AUC 10 as a metric, as a, a high, like good user experience, uh, AUC 10. Thank you, Davide. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I think with this, we conclude the session. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers for today's session and uh, not the least the two invited speakers, Weil and Luisa, who gave a wonderful talk and gave uh, very nice interesting directions for the future research. Uh, with that being said, uh, we would hope that we see next year, at least in person, uh, in the next week. Um, and I would also like to inform you that there is a very interesting workshop which is starting in about 10 minutes, if I'm right, Anna, uh, which is on explainability. I think it's in, in, in 25 minutes. So in 25 the top minutes. Of so, the hours, yeah. yeah. So we have <laughs> at least a few, few minutes to, uh, to get your coffees filled and then uh, join the next workshop. Uh, thank you all for uh, attending the workshop today. Um, I don't know if Nazar has something more to say. I just want to thank everyone uh, and hope to see you uh, not virtually next year. I don't know where is YP23, but uh, it's always somewhere interesting. Yes, we keep the hopes alive. And um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, then I would like to close the session for today. Um, thank you all again. And then looking forward to see you in the next workshop on explainability on explainability for bio biometrics. <laughs> okay, thank guys, you. Bye -bye. great. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.